The Committee on Natural Resources will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recess of the Committee at any time. The Committee is meeting today to hear testimony on unleashing America's energy and mineral potential. Under Committee Rule 4F, any oral op opening statements at hearings are limited to the Chairman and the Ranking Minority Member. I therefore ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements may be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted in accordance with Committee Rule 3.0. Without objection, so ordered. Good morning, and it's great to see everyone here for the first uh, formal hearing of our committee as we kick off uh, the 118th Congress. Uh, House Republicans made a lot of promises last year, and now the American people have given us a majority and we are ready to deliver on those promises. As we put together our legislative agenda for this Congress and heard from our constituents, it was clear that energy independence, energy security, and lowering, lowering consumer cost was a top priority uh, for our country, and therefore it's a top priority of this committee. Energy and minerals affect every part of our daily lives. Uh, just look around this room. and We flipped on a switch to turn the lights on. We're enjoying temperature controlled environment and we're receiving uh, text messages and emails on our cell phones. From the visible to the invisible, energy and minerals are woven into the fabric of our very existence. And given the de this dependency, you would think that the administration, regardless of party affiliation, would be finding every possible avenue to unlock America's potential. America's potential to produce these necessities of life that we've all come uh, to depend on so much. Instead, we've seen an attack on the production of American oil and gas, on American mining, which translates into an attack on um, the economy of America. And it also doesn't help the environment out uh, one tidbit when we're importing these products from countries that do not have near the environmental standards, near the human rights standards, or uh, can produce these materials as efficiently and as effectively as we can here at home. We are exporting wealth from the United States to many times to our adversaries uh, because of a not in my backyard mentality. Well, we hope to change that mentality and uh, give a message to the American people that we're blessed with resources here in the US that we can develop these resources that we're committed to research and to development to make these resources the cleanest, safest, um, most effective use of resources in the world and promote more human rights and more dignity through the use of resources, provide people with the, uh, the necessities of life, the opportunity to improve their lives and to enjoy the benefits that um, the energy development in this country has given not only to America, but to the rest of the world. Um, there may be a narrative out there that, uh, and I, I know from some of the organizational meetings we've had, that Republicans only care about um, the bottom line, that we don't care about the environment. Uh, I would say that's contrary to the truth. Republicans care about the environment and the economy. And we know that uh, if we produce more of these products here at home, we benefit both. We benefit fit both greatly. And we hope to be able to talk about facts. We want to look at what the real science is. I've said many times that the, the problem with the Democrats and especially this administration's policy, it's just it's two things. It's physics and math. They seem to ignore uh, the science and they ignore the math and try to create this idea of a utopia uh, that right now is centered around electric vehicles. I have no problem with electric vehicles, but they're not going to solve the world's problems. They're not going to solve any kind of climate crisis. And uh, they're certainly not going to make America more energy independent and energy secure. Uh, there's a chart behind me. You have a copy of it at your, uh, at your desk. And I hope you will take this chart and study it. This is global demand for energy, global use of energy, actually, over time by energy source. And if you study that chart, you will notice that the, the world was mainly using biomass uh, in 1800, but you had the Industrial Revolution in the mid-1800s, and you see coal come onto the scene, and the, the global 
usage of energy doubled from 1800 to 1900. And if you follow that chart and you see the increased industrialization of the world, uh, the global consumption of energy doubled again by the 1940s. Then it doubled again in the 1960s, it doubled again in the 1980s, and it doubled again just a couple of years ago. And uh, the statisticians are projecting that it will be 50% more by 2035. The world has an insatiable appetite for energy. And I hope you will look closely at that chart, and I wish President Biden had looked at this chart before he made the comment last night that, uh, you know, we, we need fossil fuels for 10 more years. Uh, fossil fuels uh, on the global energy scene make up um, over 80 percent, closer to 85 percent of the world's energy uh, uh, production. And that's not going away. And while we're hyper-focused on electric vehicles, that if you could turn, change every electric vehicle in America, or every passenger car and light duty truck to an electric vehicle overnight, you would reduce carbon emissions globally by less than 1%. Um, while we're focused on that, China's building coal-fired plants every week. It's imperative that we look at the resources we're blessed with, that we develop those uh, with the best technology and innovation possible, and that we uh, do what's best for the American people and for the world. Uh, I'm going to not close. I'm going to pause for a moment. I'm going to recognize the ranking member for an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, uh, one of the uh, extended prerogatives of the chair is that you can finish <laughs> whatever, and uh, please do. If you have more on the subject. We, we, we will have plenty of discussion during the, uh, the hearing. I want to keep it moving along. If the ranking member would like to make an Absolutely. opening statement, I will, I will yield you five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, and thank you to the witnesses for uh, being here and uh, taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to be with us and to travel here. And I, uh, I want to, uh, I mean, there was a moment yesterday during the President's State of the Union speech before Congress that I thought was almost like an epiphany uh, in that we reached a discussion about common ground. And, and, and that common ground effectively said, Social Security and Medicare are off the table. We don't have to worry about those being part of any cut list. And uh, uh, we're all going to work together to make them stronger. I thought that that was a rare and good moment uh, in which uh, at least on the surface seem to have the, the vast uh, support of all the members of Congress that were there. So that was a, uh, that was a special moment. Uh, and I would hope that as we look at the issues that are before us today uh, and, and before the jurisdiction of, that, of this committee, that we, we look to try to find some common ground on some issues. But, uh, but you know, but I don't think today is one of them. Uh, Last week, uh, four big oil giants, Exxon, Shell, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, reported the largest profits in history. Together, these uh, fossil fuel uh, Goliaths uh, made over a trillion in sales in 2022. Uh, needless to say, big oil had a good year. And on the other hand, the climate did not. Uh, the drying of the West showed no signs of slowing down. Uh, sending uh, the Colorado River reservoirs into historic shortages and, and demanding of uh, the federal government and Congress that they intervene in, that, in that, that crisis that continues to grow, the drought in the West. Uh, the hurricane, that ba uh, the hurricane, ba a hurricane battered Puerto Rico, ripped through Florida, making it the deadliest hurricane to hit the state since uh, 1935. All total, all told, the cost of climate disasters in the U.S. totaled $165 billion last year uh, and claimed far too many lives. Climate change is a public health, safety, environmental, and existential crisis like we've never known before. And, and I think because of that, uh, Democrats on this committee continue to be 
to push the issue that climate must be a central focus of any legislative consideration, and that the progress that we've made into a transition away from total dependency on fo fossil fuels, 80, 85 percent, as the chairman said, to renewable alternative energy sources that are clean and healthy for, for, for the world and for the American people, that continues to be central, central in, in what Democrats of this committee will continue to advocate for, fight for, and push for legislatively. This committee helped pass uh, the most significant investment in climate action in history uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act, the Democrats in this committee. The IRA includes $369 billion in investments for community hit hardest. That includes $4 billion for the, to address the drought in the West, almost $3 billion to build more resilient coastal communities, and of importance to the discussion today to boost federal permitting offices and environmental review processes so that the self-fulfilling prophecy of uh, no resources, no staff, and permitting taking longer and longer feeds the same argument over and over again that somehow this is uh, a deliberate attack on energy production in this country. A billion dollars to, to bring that permitting process, expedite that process uh, is in there and, and uh, we should support uh, its implementations. We made great headway in taking serious actions on climate, but uh, it looks like my colleagues across the aisle won't be building the momentum anytime soon. Instead, we're, we've decided to dedicate this first hearing, their first message to the American people, how to make it easier for polluters to, prof to prosper in this country. During today's hearing, you'll hear about the need, quote unquote, streamline permitting, and to quote, unleash our energy potential. But before we get all hung up on these catchy slogans, and they lure us into a drill baby drill frenzy, let's call them for what they are. They're nothing more than, than the industry's newest buzzwords, designed to trick the American people into giving them what they want. And what do these industries want? They want to hoard more of our public lands, despite the fact that fossil fuel industry already has thousands of approved permits across 26 million acres that they aren't even using. They want to, quote, streamline permitting by stripping us of public input, the public's right to know, despite, uh, despite the fact that they already ignore and tramp all, all over environmental justice communities. They want to fast track drilling and mining projects. I'm on my time right now, sir. Uh, so they can make more money more easily, despite the fact that they are already raking in trillions by taking corporate handouts and ripping off the American taxpayers. They want Republicans to do their bidding, to make it happen, which they seem all too willing to do. But no matter what happens, no matter what Republicans want, the American people have a different vision for the future. And that involves dealing with the climate crisis, continuing the momentum toward a transition away from fossil fuels, and making center in all discussions and legislative actions going forward, how, what does this do and how does this abate, mitigate, and remediate the issues around the climate crisis? With that, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Now you're back. Ranking Member Yields back. And as you can see, we're going to have a spirited discussion today. I look forward to delving into uh, a lot of those charges made by my colleague. And I think we can, uh, I think the record will show that uh, Republicans are on the side of the climate, they're on the side of the environment and we actually have solutions that work. And to be able to have this discussion, we've got a great panel of witnesses before us today. I want to introduce our witnesses from panel one. We have Mr. Eric Melito, president of the National Ocean Industries Association here in Washington, D.C. Mr. J.C. Sandberg, chief advocacy officer from the American Clean Power in Washington, D.C. Ms. Dana Johnson, Senior Director of Strategy and Federal Policy uh, for WE Act for Environmental Justice from Washington, D.C., and Ms. Kathleen Sagama, no stranger to our committee, who's President of the Western Energy Alliance in Denver, Colorado. Let me remind witnesses that under committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but their entire statement will appear in the hearing record. 
To begin your testimony, please, please press the talk button on the microphone. Uh, we do use timing lights. When you begin, the light will turn green. When you have one minute left, the light will turn yellow. And at the end of five minutes, the light will turn red. And I will ask you to please complete your statement. I will also allow witnesses on the panel to testify before member questioning. The chair now recognizes Mr. Melito for five minutes. Chairman Westerman, Ranking Member Grijalva, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify. My name is Eric Melito, and I'm president of the National Ocean Industries Association, or NOIA. At NOIA, we represent all segments of the offshore energy industry, including offshore oil and gas, offshore wind, offshore minerals, offshore carbon sequestration, and other emerging technologies. Our members include not just energy developers, but also the businesses, large and small, that do the work of building, supplying, and operating offshore energy projects. The same U.S. companies in the supply chain that have built out the U.S. offshore oil and gas sector are already participating in the build out of the U.S. offshore wind sector and are leading U.S. efforts to develop carbon capture and storage infrastructure. The offshore region, and the Gulf of Mexico in particular, have served as the backbone of U.S. energy production for decades. The U.S. has been producing oil in the federal Gulf of Mexico waters since the 1940s, and production in the Gulf has been steadily increasing over the past 30 years. In fact, this region has been producing more than 1 million barrels of oil per day since 1997, and at its highest level of production on record, just over 2 million barrels per day in August of 2019, right before the onset of the pandemic. When compared to countries around the world, the U.S. Gulf of Mexico would be the 11th largest producer of oil in the global marketplace. In terms of energy affordability, production from the U.S. Gulf of Mexico plays a substantial role helping to meet global demand for energy. The U.S. Gulf of Mexico oil and gas sector truly is an economic engine. It supports about 370,000 jobs, and these jobs are dispersed throughout the country. U.S. oil and gas production and Gulf of Mexico production in particular provide Americans with the best product when it comes to low carbon barrels. Oil produced from the Gulf has a carbon intensity one half that of other producing regions. U.S. offshore facilities are state of the art, built with efficient modern designs that help to serve and prevent emissions and deliver high volumes of oil and gas with a smaller physical footprint. Policies that restrict domestic offshore development require imports to make up the shortfall. And that supplemental production comes from higher emitting operations in other countries. Foreign providers generally employ less environmentally protective production methods, which when combined with the added emissions from importing oil over great distances by tanker, increases the amount of carbon released into the atmosphere rather than decreasing it. U.S. offshore wind is poised for dramatic growth. Offshore wind development in federally managed waters offers enormous economic and environmental benefits and will help meet renewable energy goals, while the development of U.S. wind opportunities will provide substantial benefits to states adjacent to lease areas, it will also lead to tremendous investment throughout the nation. In areas like the Gulf Coast, you will find steel fabricators, offshore service vessels, subsea construction companies, helicopter service providers, and more who built their experience in the oil and gas industry but will be vital to building offshore wind. The U.S. Gulf Coast region is also uniquely situated to emerge as a global hub for carbon capture and storage, or CCS. CCS has been identified by experts throughout the world as key to meeting climate objectives. Along with excellent geologic prospects for storing carbon dioxide, the Gulf Coast is home to the full supply chain of energy companies with the engineering expertise, experience, and vision to deploy CCS projects with the scale and efficiency necessary for success. U.S. energy policy should support the development and availability of all forms of abundant, reliable, and affordable energy supplies for Americans, while continuously reducing impacts and driving down emissions. Whether it is offshore oil and gas, offshore wind, or offshore CCS, the federal government must provide a pathway for investment through certainty in leasing, permitting, and regulation. Failure to do so will not prevent the investment. It will only prevent the investment from occurring here in the United States. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Mr. Melito, thank you for your testimony. Uh, 
Now I want to recognize Mr. Sandberg. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Westerman, Ranking Member, member Grijalva, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is J.C. Sandberg, and I am the Chief Advocacy Officer of the American Clean Power Association. ACP is a leading national clean energy trade association that unites over 750 utilities, developers, manufacturers, purchasers, and transmission companies focused on deploying utility scale onshore and offshore wind, solar, storage, and hydrogen. The clean, energy, clean power industry has become a significant part of our nation's energy mix. Today, over 15% of our nation's power comes from wind and solar. Enough wind, solar, and battery storage have been installed to power 59 million homes. The clean power industry provides 443,000 American jobs and contributes to local economies across the country by delivering over $2.8 billion annually in state and local taxes and landowner lease payments. And we are poised to see significant growth over the next 10 years with expanded investments in clean energy. These investments will unleash further economic growth, create more good paying American jobs, lower energy costs, improve our nation's domestic energy security and independence, strengthen the reliability and re resiliency of the grid, and lower carbon emissions. But a key hurdle to the future development and deployment of domestic clean energy is our current federal permitting system. Successful deployment of clean energy resources requires a predictable, timely, and cost-effective permitting framework. However, the current process is anything but. It takes an energy generation project like a new solar or wind farm an average of four and a half years to obtain necessary NEPA reviews. To put that into perspective, a project that begins review at the very beginning of a presidential administration will not be completed by the end of the term. For transmission projects, it's even worse, taking an average of six and a half years. Some reviews can take as long as a decade. These delays create uncertainty and raise costs for project developers and consumers, as projects are typically not allowed to proceed without a completed NEPA analysis. Meanwhile, loans and other financial obligations must be met and materials must be purchased and stored. There is also the opportunity cost. Money invested in a project waiting to break ground could be invested somewhere else, impeding further clean energy deployment and job creation opportunities. Permitting challenges fall especially hard on energy production located on federal lands and waters. Although federal lands have the capacity to host a vastly larger number of clean energy projects than they currently do, the cumbersome federal permitting process makes it much more attractive to invest on private lands. For offshore wind, projects that were built almost exclusively in federal waters, we are also seeing significant delays due to an inefficient and outdated permitting approval process established nearly two decades ago. Addressing our permitting challenges at the federal level will be critical to the future development and deployment of domestic clean energy. It is possible to implement common sense reforms that strike the right balance of timely decisions for projects while preserving thorough environmental reviews and maintaining collaboration with state and local stakeholders. ACP is encouraged by ongoing efforts and various legislative proposals from both sides of the aisle, including the Transparency and Production of American Energy Act that Chairman Westerman introduced in the last Congress. The TAP American Energy Act contains key provisions that would advance the clean energy infrastructure de development and deployment in the U.S., while not undermining our bedrock environmental laws by, among other things, putting clear timelines on NEPA reviews and eliminating requirements of duplicative environmental reviews and analysis. Without common sense reforms, like the ones outlined in the TAP American Energy Act, and further detailed in my written testimony, America will be unable to reach our full clean energy potential. ACP looks forward to continuing to work with this committee and Congress on these important issues. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you, Mr. Sandberg, for your testimony. The chair now recognizes Ms. Johnson for five minutes. Good morning, Chair, uh, Ranking Member Grijalva, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute to this important conversation. We Act for Environmental Justice is a northern Manhattan-based member organization whose mission is to build healthy communities. We do this by ensuring that people living in a community of color or an area of low income lead in creating sound and fair environmental health and protection policies and practices at the city, state, and federal level. 
Our federal policy office also serves as the administrative anchor for the Environmental Justice Leadership Forum, which is a network of 50 EJ orgs and advocates that represent 22 states and really work to ensure that their interests are represented in policies and uh, um, practices um, at every level of government. Today, I am here to offer you two considerations as you begin the important deliberations on how best to legislatively ensure that our energy economy addresses the climate crises, is accessible and affordable, and protects those who have a history of being adversely impacted by fossil fuel operations. I want to start by urging you to keep environmental justice at the forefront of your policymaking. 18 million people live within one mile of an active oil or gas well in the U.S., including a disproportionately large number of communities of color, people living below the poverty line, older Americans, and young children. More than one million African Americans in places like Texas, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia live within a half mile of an existing gas facility, and that number is expected to grow. Members of the Navajo Nation in New Mexico are twice as likely to live within a half mile of an oil and gas facility compared to the rest of the state's population. And more than a million Californians live within a half mile of an active oil and gas facility, and of those million, 50% of them are of Hispanic origin. We know that race more than income is a primary factor in our land use decisions, and as a result, we see greater adverse health impacts from fossil fuel operations in our communities. These include early death, heart attacks, respiratory disorders, stroke, asthma, and absenteeism at school and work. And the financial cost? An estimated $886 billion are spent annually on health impacts from pollution related to fossil fuel operations. Please know that people living on the front line and fence line of fossil fuel operations want you to take action to address our energy needs. But they want you to ask yourselves three critical questions along the way. Are you creating an environment for producing or expanding an energy source that will harm communities? Are you perpetuating racially and economically disproportionate health and environmental burdens? And are you prolonging the climate crises in communities where climate change is centered? We hope that your answers to these questions will be no. Second, I urge you to uphold the democratic process that our current per permitting legislation provides. We repeatedly hear three concerns in our work. How do we ensure energy democracy, a just transition, and uplift the need for creating justice in permitting? How will we fast track traditional and clean energy projects in a way that does not perpetuate land grabs on indigenous lands and undermine indigenous sovereignty? How do we impress upon you as legislators to focus on permitting in a way that protects our voice and provides recourse? The National Environmental Policy Act has been called the People's Environmental Law. Since its inception, NEPA um, has been copied in more than 185 countries in the United States, 16 states have written their own little NEPAs for state-level projects. NEPA is so influential that many call it the Magna Carta of environmental laws. By giving people a voice in federal project planning, NEPA is a key tool to advance our democracy and environmental justice. Public participation is an opportunity for impacted communities to provide critical input for the just and sustainable implementation of a project that could significantly, significantly affect their health and surrounding environment. We need time to organize our responses to long technical documents. And in an effort to decrease that process, like those related to energy decisions, is extreme and it's undemocratic. I want to close by requesting that you consider the Environmental Justice for All Act, which was introduced in the 117th as HR 2021. It's community-led legislation, and it addresses public comment periods, proactively considers alternatives, considers cumulative impacts, and um, focuses on meaningfully consulting with tribes. When these things are done, projects move at an appropriate pace. Again, we strongly support the reintroduction of the EJ for All Act in this session of Congress. Thank you for your testimony. The cha chair now recognizes Ms. Sagama for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I, um, 
uh, my written testimony is there. I think I'm going to deviate a little bit um, because I just I feel the need to address um, some of the statements. Um, you know, calling the oil and gas industry polluters is uh, just simply misinformation. We work hard every single day to ensure that we are reducing environmental impact and we produce oil and natural gas more sustainably and more environmentally protective than any other country in the world. So when you talk about energy, let's get realistic. Um, you know, it, I had to laugh when the president said that we'll have oil and natural gas for the next 10 years. Well, his energy um, agency, the Department of Energy, predicts oil and gas consumption will continue to rise through 2050. And it will continue to rise beyond that. They just project to 2050. And that's because oil and natural gas provide a huge benefit to humanity. They provide environmental justice for all by providing affordable, reliable energy. Let's look at the impact from so-called clean energy. When you call us produce polluters, what about the huge mining waste in the Congo? What about the slave labor in China? What about all the, the minerals used? And I would note all the petroleum that goes into solar panels and wind turbines and all the minerals they need. So there's an environmental impact for any source of energy. We work hard in the oil and natural gas industry to make sure that our environmental impact is reduced and managed. We don't shove it over to Congo and to China and other areas of the world. We manage it here in the United States and we do so more cleanly than anywhere else. So when the president has to go to Venezuela, Russia, Saudi Arabia to get oil and natural gas because he's trying to stop federal oil on public lands, then he's bringing in something that has a higher environmental impact that's produced non-sustainably, and that increases greenhouse gas emissions. The oil and natural gas industry is the number one reason the United States has reduced more greenhouse gas emissions than any other country. It's because of the increased use of natural gas as an electricity generation source. We have reduced more greenhouse gas emissions than wind and solar combined. Because we're reliable, we're on 24-7 unlike intermittent wind and solar. So we pick up the pace when um, wind and solar cannot provide any energy. We back up wind and solar. We enable wind and solar. Um, when those EVs need to run, they're running on coal and natural gas. So we're proud to be providing the energy that Americans actually use. And when it comes to environmental justice, um, there, there's a reason there are a lot of oil and gas wells in the Navajo Nation. Because the Navajo Nation develops its energy for the benefit of its people. It provides livelihoods for the Navajo Nation. Um, we return about 20, $96 million to about 20,000 individual Navajo mineral owners every year. That's in ju environmental justice. That sustains their livelihoods. And when we are in communities, when we um, operate near communities, we don't choose what communities we find oil and natural gas in. Um, that happened millions of years ago when that oil and natural gas was uh, baked under layers, geological layers, you know, millions and millions of years ago. So we develop where we find it. And in the West, we are not hoarding public lands. In fact, we are down 71% from a high in the 1980s we, um, when, there used to be about 168 million acres of federal lands under lease. Today, it's under 25 million. And from that 25 million, um, only about 450,000 acres actually have any surface dis development on them, whether it's a well pad, a road to get to that well pad. So we are producing much more from federal lands with much less impact on the lands. So I just felt the need to address some of that misinformation. I look forward to discussing NEPA and um, the Inflation Reduction Act and other ways that Congress can um, 
put more sanity into our oil and natural gas regulatory environment. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you for your uh, testimony, Ms. Sagawa. We're now going to go to member questions. And uh, first, we'll recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Lamborn, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having this hearing. I want to thank all the witnesses for being here this morning. I have here in my hand a letter from Laura Daniel Davis, Principal Deputy Assistant Director at the Department of Interior, dated December 8, 2022, that has some very interesting statistics on the Biden administration's approval rate for applications for permits to drill. So, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to and it's, by, uh, it's to me and 43 of my colleagues. I asked unanimous consent to introduce this letter into the record. Without objection. Specifically, in this letter, the Biden administration is taking credit for what the Trump administration accomplished. This letter states, quote, the BLM approved 5,145 APDs, applications for permits to drill, in fiscal year 2021, surpassing the fiscal year 2020 total of 4,600 approximately approvals. This period includes the last few months of the Trump presidency when the Department of the Interior was approving APDs at an unprecedented rate. According to a 2020 GAO report, APD review times decreased from 196 days to 94 days between 2016 and 2019. Curiously, the Department of Interior is no longer publishing its month-by-month -month breakdown of approved APDs, which previous administrations have done. So, Ms. Sagama, can you please talk about how the APD approval process has changed under President Biden? What's that doing to American energy production? Well, I think the um, initially the rate went, I mean, it's been fluctuating. The monthly rate of approved APDs has been fluctuating. Um, we're would we wish that the federal bureaucracy could be more consistent in approving permits? Certainly. And um, sometimes if there was more um, regularity and more certainty on when we'd get a permit, we wouldn't have to request permits so far in advance. Um, but generally we have seen the rates kind of fluctuate um, coming and going. I think when it comes to federal lands, we're a little bit more concerned with the games being played on the leasing side. Because if leasing dries up, as it has with the initial Biden ban on leasing, um, then we're really concerned about future production. But um, the permits have kind of, they've stabilized. We're getting permits, not, not as quickly as would be efficient, but um, I think we're more concerned about the leasing aspect right now. Okay, and a similar question. Um, our friends across the aisle like to bring up the fact that there are 9,000 approved permits to drill across the U.S. which remain unused. And so the implication is that energy companies are derelict in their pursuit of their own interests of, to pursue energy and make a, make a profit and create jobs off of that. Um, but aren't there a lot of reasons why an APD not be used? And uh, could you elaborate on that, Ms. Sagama? And what can be done to make those 9,000 outstanding APDs more usable? Sure. If, they, if that's what they really, if that's what we all really want. Yeah, I appreciate that question because when um, the press secretary brought up 9,000 permits um, about a year ago, um, it certainly raised the, the issue. There are about 8,600 permits um, that have been approved that have not been used yet, um, and that's as of September. So we don't know the actual up-to-date number. But why? Well, there are a variety of reasons. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the inefficiency of getting a permit means that companies often request permits years in advance because um, if you have started a project, we drill wells really quickly now. We're so efficient that, and we drill so many on a well pad that you can't afford to start your project, drill one or two wells, and then have to wait for um, 
two more permits because you're going to put, you know, whatever, eight wells on that pad or whatever it is. So in order to stay ahead of your rig, you need an inventory of permits. And since you don't know if it's going to take six months or two years to get your permit, you often get those permits in hand before you even start the project and have them in hand for a couple of years in advance. So that's one of the reasons. The other is simply you might be waiting for a right away from the federal government. Um, you might be waiting for, you know, in order to get to your well pad, you have to get across a piece of federal land, so you need a permit for that. You might be held up waiting for an air permit. So there are other reasons that we don't use those permits right away. Or litigation. Um, yeah, well, we've just had a case last week uh, in, in uh, New Mexico where a judge um, called into question about 370 permits in New Mexico. We have uh, litigation from environmental groups on about 4,000 um, permits in um, New Mexico and Wyoming. Thank Absolutely. you, Mr. Ch Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlemen's time's expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gago, for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Westerman, Ranking Member Grijalva. Uh, as we have conversation in this committee around permitting reform, and I don't doubt we will have a lot of them, uh, we can't lose sight of why talking to people who live near these infrastructure projects is important. We know that frontline communities are more likely to be harmed by air and water pollution from mining and drilling projects. These include tribes and minority communities. So we need a permitting system that allows clean energy projects to move forward in a timely way. But we can do that while still making sure that impacted communities have a chance to participate in the process and protect the air and water they use to survive. We can do both and we should do both. To that end, I have a question for Ms. Johnson. In the Inflation Reduction Act, Democrats provided almost a billion dollars for permitting agencies to ensure these reviews are efficient and effective while still capturing public input. From your perspective, how will this help improve NEPA's reviews going forward? Thank you very much for the question. Um, we know that the two leading reasons why projects don't advance is because they were underfunded and because the NEPA process was not followed. Making nearly a billion dollars of resources available provides opportunity for the government to staff up, to modernize systems and processes so that projects can move forward appropriately. As was noted, the Inflation Reduction Act, as well as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Package, includes the financial resources to be able to move work forward. And so when we have the financial resources to move a project forward and we follow the NEPA process, then things move at an appropriate timeline. When we don't, when we try to undermine communities, when we try to skirt around processes, then we find ourselves having to take a step back and look at um, recourse, legal opportunities, um, and be sure that um, um, we've done the appropriate work to, to be sure that um, a project moves forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You'll back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from Minnesota, the chair of the Subcommittee on Energy and Minerals, Mr. Stauber. You recognize uh, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, uh, and I appreciate uh, all the witnesses. I want to thank you all for your testimony. Uh, I'd like to start by noting that the Nonpartisan Energy Information Institute projects significant increases in global and oil uh, and gas demand for the next five years. <clears throat> Ms. Gamma, it's great to see you and thank you once again for joining us today. The importance of your membership to American energy security is not lost on me. However, as you stated so clearly in your testimony, we need to update our broken permitting process so, you, so your producers can produce. Rolling back the 2020 NEPA uh, rule was a mistake. Could you elaborate a little more on how agencies focusing on hypothetical project impacts isn't grounded in reality? and how harmful that rule has been to your membership and to Americans nationwide. Thank you for the question. And I, I would agree with Mr. Sandberg. Um, you know, groups are using NEPA to slow down wind and solar projects as well. Um, we saw with the 2020 um, rules a just a sensible reforms to put appropriate page limits and time limits and focus NEPA on the actual impacts at hand. Because, I mean, I agree with Ms. Johnson. Um, 
we want communities to be involved. The NEPA process has public comment already baked into it. It's part of the process. Um, but what was happening is NEPA is taking um, 5, 10, 15 years for roads, 20, bridges. 20 sometimes in a mining uh, uh, community in mine. Go ahead. Yep. Um, but, but even for roads, like they're adding costs for communities all across the country and taking 10 years to build a road to do NEPA because often um, the agencies are requiring the project proponent to do basically research projects. So instead of actually focusing on the impacts from the project, they have to do hypothetical studies on, um, you know, cumulative impacts on other projects together with the project at hand. So they have to consider all these things that are far related. We're getting um, requirements to do greenhouse gas analysis, not from the project, but all down the line to try to imagine what the end user is going to do with that oil or natural gas. So hypothetical research far beyond the impacts of the project at hand, and certainly far beyond the impacts of the communities at hand. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Melito, thank you again for joining us. Uh, we understand and appreciate the work your membership does for our nation. As you noted, a barrel of oil from the Gulf accounts for half the emissions of oil developed abroad. However, this administration only offered two offshore lease sales, jacked up the royalty to disincentivize participation, and then didn't defend it in court. If global demand is rising for oil and your membership provides a smaller emissions profile, what do you think a five-year plan should look like that meets global demand challenges with the most efficient development in the world? Uh, thank you, sir. Appreciate the question. And you know, a lot of arguments are made that our industry, we have enough leases, but, but those arguments really ignore the fundamental realities of the energy business. Whether it's oil and gas, solar, wind, you need acreage to develop the resource. The more acreage, the more energy you can produce. And to get acreage, you, you need leasing. And offshore is a region that is still an exploratory business. So when you get a lease, there is absolutely no guarantee that it's gonna produce oil or natural gas. A company spend between 100 and 200 million dollars to determine whether or not a particular lease even has oil and gas. And most times, they come up empty. So having a predictable, regularly scheduled um, plan for leasing is vitally important. We have an opportunity to go from the 1.8 million barrels today we're producing, the estimates are if we have continued leasing and continued permitting, we get to 2.4 million barrels. We also can go from 370,000 jobs to 420, 430,000 jobs. But to do that, we should have at least two lease sales per year in the Gulf of Mexico. That will also help out offshore wind because under the IRA, you need offshore oil and gas leasing to issue the wind leases. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, quickly, Mr. Sandberg, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, yes or no, does American Clean Power understand the necessity and benefits of domestic mining to your industry? And does American Clean Power support domestic mining? Thank you for the question. We support the reshoring of supply chain, and a part of that we think is, is a continuing exploration for critical minerals domestically. Uh, so you support domestic mining. Is that what you said? We support the reshoring of supply chain. <laughs> That's all you got. <laughs> Do you support domestic mining or not? Do you support mining in Minnesota or not? We support the mining of critical minerals in the U.S. to Thank you. You and I are going to have a great US. conversation. That's all you, I, I appreciate uh, the answer because I had, to, I had to actually pull it out of you, and that's kind of uh, um, the, the concerning, but thank you very much. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Oregon, Ms. Hoyle, for five minutes. Thank you. I represent the south coast of Oregon, 250 miles of the most beautiful coastline in the United States. Sorry, everybody else, but I do. Um, and we're on the forefront of seeing the effects of climate change, whether it's wildfire, because um, we have federal and state and private um, timberlands, drought, ocean acidification. So I firmly believe that we need to move to green energy, move away from fossil fuel, and move to green energy resources as quickly as possible. I also am one of the few people in Congress who's actually run 
an agency. I ran, I was the labor commissioner, so I ran the Bureau of Labor and Industries. And one of the things that I found was coming into an agency um, was that there was a lot of bureaucracy and rules that people didn't understand. And it made our, the things that were written were written at a law school or graduate school level, which meant that vulnerable workers, small businesses, couldn't understand the process. So I also think, I, I do think that many of my Republican colleagues across the aisle think that the solution to that is to privatize government um, work or to just decrease or wipe away regulation. And um, what I think is we need to ensure that we have protections for workers. We need to have high environmental standards, right, for anything that we do. But there is a way to do it. And I think as Democrats, we have to acknowledge that the process is difficult so that my community, we're, we're weighing in on potential offshore wind, um, but the tribal communities, the low-income communities, the fishing communities that want to weigh in on this, the business community, they need to be able to access the information, which means that that process could be shorter without decreasing the standards if we make it more accessible. You shouldn't have to, no offense to lawyers, but you shouldn't have to hire a lawyer to weigh in on what's happening in your community. So I think we can do both and, and I am happy to work in partnership with anyone to make those things more accessible, more, more reasonable, and for normal people, no offense to lawyers in the room, for normal people to understand what the rules are. So I think we can do both of those things. But my question is for um, Mr. Sandberg. So, and, and I did prepare for this hearing, um, and I saw that uh, American Clean Power highlighted an article on the 100,000 new jobs um, already created by the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which Democrats passed last Congress. The clean energy tax credits in the Inflation Reduction Act also will make sure workers are paid prevailing wage and the projects that use workers from registered high quality apprenticeship programs um, like the ones I oversaw as labor commissioner um, will be utilized. And I think that's important as we build our workforce because I don't care what side of the aisle you're on, workforce is critical that we expand and invest in. So um, could you share more about the jobs being created thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act? Thank you for the question. It's an exciting time for the clean energy industry, and as the industry continues to grow, um, we continue to employ more people. Uh, as you mentioned, the, the, the most recent uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, included some provisions for a certain labor, um, to use certain types of labor, and the industry has supported that and has continues to work with government to, to get a workable framework around that. But we are excited as the industry continues to grow across the value chain at the jobs that are coming whether it's in manufacturing, whether it's installation and development. So it, it provides a rich opportunity for us to continue to grow the, both the domestic workforce and the domestic manufacturing base. The gentlelady yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Curtis, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and a special thanks uh, for this hearing today to our witnesses. Uh, before I move to my comments and questions, I want to address some comments that were made in opening remarks that seem to imply that uh, Republicans only care about fossil fuels, that we want to oversubsidize uh, the industry that uh, we own uh, and are responsible for the great profits that they've had in the last few months, um, that we're all about drill, baby, drill. None of these comments are helpful uh, to a productive dialogue. I'd like to quote from an article at the uh, Wall Street Journal Opinion Board. Uh, the name of the article is Joe Biden's Big Oil Profits. To quote, behold the irony, President Biden has done more to enrich big oil and its shareholders than Donald Trump or any other White House occupant in decades. He goes on to say, uh, but big oil companies are merely benefiting from supply shortages and production constraints the administration has helped to create. I gave my staff a three-minute drill. In about three minutes, they found over $100 billion of subsidies to the fossil fuel industry in the IRA and other Biden legislation with carbon sequestration, biofuels, and direct air capture. So I, I'd just like to point out this narrative is not accurate. It's offensive and doesn't help move the, uh, the conversation along. Now, um, by turning to our guest today, um, 
I'm pleased, uh, Mr. Sandberg, to be here with you again. You and I shared a few minutes out in my district where we talked a little bit about your industry and, and the branding of your industry. And one of the comments that I made at that point was, I think Republicans uh, feel that we've been falsely branded as somehow not liking uh, clean energy and renewables. And I think it's misconstrued with our thoughts that it's not the only answer to our energy future, but that we also feel like that you're an important part of our mix and, and what we're doing. Um, I'd, I'd be curious, um, what your feeling is about this whole permitting issue, uh, how much it's restraining you, and uh, what we need to do about it. First, uh, it was a pleasure to be with you in your district uh, and to share some time with you. I, I think for, you ask, uh, I think there is an ability to provide common sense reforms to NEPA processes. We're not um, suggesting for a second that we undermine kind of the bedrock environmental laws of this country, but there is an ability, I think, to make some common sense reforms to do this, and I think the Congress can do that. What does that do for the industry? Like any other industry, um, capital chases not just returns, but it chases certainty and wants to avoid risk. And I think these delays in permitting uh, introduce uncertainty into the mix. So the, the, to the extent that we can take some of that uncertainty out by having a, a more regular and consistent permitting process, that's going to help us deploy more clean energy. It's, it's almost going to sound uh, rhetorical, but um, it must be asked, um, can we move forward in uh, quicker times, more predictable times, and still be good stewards? I don't believe they're mutually exclusive, sir. I think we can do both. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Agma, do you want to comment on that as well? Sure, I think we can do both. I think the problem arises when um, certain people and politicians promise that we can just replace oil and natural gas in 10 years. I mean, at the start of the Obama administration, we were supposed to be gone in 10 years. So let's be realistic about how these energy sources work together. And let's recognize that wind and solar are facing the same NEPA delays that oil and gas are. So let's work together and make NEPA a reasonable process. So a, a couple of points. I, I was tempted to joke, and you've now prompted me, and please understand, I'm, I'm not serious, but the comment last night about fossil fuels being here in 10 years kind of makes me want to say I'm, I'm pretty confident renewables will be here in 10 years. Mm. Right, and they'll be part of our energy mix. We, we all know, and if you look at the, the chairman's graph over there, we need all of you, and, and we need all of you to be on your game. And we, know, we need all of you to be working towards reliable, affordable, clean energy. And um, if you can't all achieve that, we're going to be short, all of you. And I think that's very important. I also want to point out that I don't know a single person on my side of the aisle that wants to undermine the environmental standards in NEPA. But to a person, I think we say it takes too long uh, to get an answer. And once the answer comes, there's no certainty. And that needs to be fixed. It doesn't matter if you want to put it in wind or solar or uh, pipelines. All of that needs to be fixed. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield my time. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Alaska, Ms. Patola, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. I, I represent Alaska, and Alaska um, really depends on oil and gas development. So much of our state's economy, you know, households, about a third of our households are part of that sector, um, and it pays household bills. But at the statewide level, it is the vast majority of our revenues that make sure that we're, the state is doing its constitutionally required obligations of schools, public safety, public transportation. And so we, we just, we're very serious and earnest and um, absolute about our need for responsible development. And at the same time, we are, we, we, I think to a person in Alaska, they could give you about 50 examples of climate change. Uh, we had five snowless winters. It's impacted almost all of our species. Um, we have a lot of species in, in crisis. So we, as Alaskans, we really are balancing these two things. But um, to my great surprise, not everybody knows about NEPA. I, you know, when I came here, I was shocked to find out that people on the East Coast don't know the acronyms that are just uh, part of our vernacular in Alaska, um, a FEIS and a ROD and all of those things. But um, one of the things I'm very concerned about is public input, because that is integral to the NEPA process, is that iterative process of 
preferred alternatives and, and getting to the perfect compromise. And I just wondered, um, Mr. Sandberg, this question is for you. How can Congress help support the efforts of companies you represent while ensuring local community input? And is the EIS process for development projects sufficient for local input? So we appreciate the question. I think from the very beginning and the earliest stages of clean energy development, our developers are engaging with communities. They have to um, in an open and transparent way. And I think that um, as, we, as we do that, we find that oftentimes project opposition um, comes from many forms, but also oftentimes it is, is full of misinformation. So as we engage early in that process, both um, disadvantaged communities, local communities, as, as we seek permits from state, local, and federal agencies, um, we find that early, frequent, sustained engagement helps us find a more smooth process. Do I think that there can be reforms to the NEPA process? Absolutely, right? I think that there are some common sense things that we can do together that, um, uh, and many of those we've detailed in written testimony and we're happy to engage on, but I do think there are some process improvements that can be made on NEPA. And then I have a, a, a question for you, Ms. Johnson. Um, and, and as I mentioned, I want to ensure local communities have a clear seat at the table. And I firmly believe that residents know best and they know better than anyone how to protect their environment. And do you think that industry is doing enough in that regard? Thank you for the question. Um, I think that it is important for industry to look holistically at the impact of a project. And so taking the time to hear from people who have a real lived experience um, is critical. I think taking the time to do an environmental assessment so that we are considering the cumulative impact and exposure that people might have to a particular project is important and necessary. I think it's a false narrative to suggest that to do those things is too detailed and it's too costly. Um, we, as I stated earlier, incur cost when we go around community, when we don't consider them. We incur cost because we did not pr appropriately plan or budget for a project. And so I think that um, um, to, to reference, you know, a comment earlier about, you know, hypothetical studies, um, you know, being unnecessary. Um, we don't th th think that they're hypothetical. We think that they're important. They consider the economic, the environmental, uh, the public health impacts, um, and what that might cost us. And it's important for us to do it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. And Lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, when you think about everything that uh, we require just for our survival, not to mention the quality of our lives, everything, everything is either mined or it's grown. That's the only way to get it. And yet this is precisely what the environmental left has targeted to suppress for the last generation. And as I pointed out recently, it, it, it's ironic that on the one hand, they tell us we have to produce millions of, of new batteries for everything from electric cars to, to the industrial grid. And then on the other hand, we, uh, they're doing everything they can to shut down the exponential increase in mining that these so-called green policies require. You know, our prosperity requires not only the mineral resources that mining produces, it also requires cheap energy that fossil fuels produce. Last night, President Biden told us that the supply chain needs to start in America. Well, by God, the supply chain starts with the raw materials required to support everything that our economy produces and that every family depends upon for its survival and its comfort and its security. And that's precisely what this administration is bringing to a standstill. I mean, look at this war on fossil fuels. Fossil fuels produce 80% of the electricity in our economy. They produce it far more cheaply than wind and solar. Yet the very first act of this administration was to cancel the Keystone Pipeline, which today should be delivering about 800,000 barrels of crude oil every day into American markets. According to a study that was released this week, if the administration had just continued the energy policies of the Trump administration, America would be producing between two and three million barrels a day more than we are. 
Instead, we're begging Venezuela and Saudi Arabia to produce more, so much for made in America. Um, and that's why fossil fuel prices are skyrocketing. Uh, you know, if you're upset about record profits for oil companies, that's what's making those record profits possible. When something is scarce, it becomes expensive. When it's plentiful, it's cheap. Trump made it plentiful, and on Inauguration Day, the average price of a gallon of gas was $2.59 a gallon. Today, it's $3.48 and rising. Where the hell do they expect the electricity for their electric cars and trains and stoves to come from? If you deliberately were to set out to destroy the prosperity of working Americans, I, is there a more effective way to do that than dramatically restrict mining and drilling and then divert these limited resources from their most economically productive uses uh, to the ideological hobby horses of the woke environmentalist left. Wind and solar are among the most expensive ways to produce electricity. And as uh, Ms. Sagama pointed out, unreliable wind and solar require conventional energy in order to maintain the electrical grid. That usually means running gas turbines at ready reserve in order to switch over the moment a cloud passes over a solar array or, or the wind falls off. Ms. Agama, what future do you foresee for our country if these policies continue? Well, I, I agree with you. When we make energy scarce, we make it more expensive. And who does that hurt the most? Not the wealthy. It hurts low-income communities. It hurts disadvantaged communities. Um, having access to abundant, affordable energy is, it's the basis of um, human welfare. So these policies are impoverishing working Americans, low-income Americans. And at the same time, our friends on the left says they really want to help the, these folks. Does that make any sense at all? It doesn't make sense to me. And that study you mentioned, we could have two to three million more barrels a day production here in the United States where it's produced in an environmental manner. That means that we're sending about $100 billion from that same study overseas instead of enjoying the tax benefits of it here. That we, you know, the taxes that come from oil and gas sustain communities, sustain vital services. Um, it's, you know, what funds um, the government is, you know, private enterprise. It's productivity, exactly right. The government doesn't uh, uh, finance the private sector, that's the private sector that uh, finances the government, and that's what they're shutting down. I'm reminded of Leo Tolstoy's line. He says, I sit on a man's back, choking him and making him carry me. And all the while, I assure himself and anyone else who will listen that I'm very sympathetic of his plight, and I'm willing to do everything I can to help, except by getting off his back. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Dingle, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Too many treat economic security, national security, and environmental security as mutually exclusive goals, rather than the means to secure real climate protections. It's clear we need to accelerate our transition to a clean energy economy, but to meet our climate goals, Democrats have secured a historic climate investments in the Inflation Reduction Act, and enacted a game-changing bipartisan infrastructure bill. But there is more real work ahead of us. Deploying zero emission technologies at scale across the country will be the greatest permitting challenge in generations. And we must build in ways that do not do harm to our communities or degrade our environment. The climate crisis demonstrates repeatedly that our economic security, national security, and environmental security goals are completely interconnected and demand permitting solutions that match this urgency through both efficiency of review and inclusivity of voices of the communities most affected. I welcome my Republican colleagues' interest in permitting reform. For me, I look at permitting reform as a tool to combat climate change strengthen our economy, and protect our national security. But we must bring everyone to the table to do this right. We must continue to ensure that frontline communities and those who are fighting to protect their homes are heard. 
We must cement a critical mineral supply chain here in America. It's critical. We must confront climate change and advance the electrified transportation industry that will lead our way forward. And personally, as the spouse of the man that originally wrote NEPA, I know we've got to protect its original intent and fine tune it for today's realities. It's not an either or problem. It's a necessity for a prosperous American future. Ms. Johnson, as I mentioned, Democrats have had a historically productive last two years. Between the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, we directed billions to improving our infrastructure and deploying renewable energy. As these projects begin benefiting communities across the country, why is it important that we ensure community input is key in the design process? And can you highlight the specific importance of the NEPA process in our transition to a clean economy? Thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, I want to start off by just um, reflecting back on some of the conversation that we're having about the economic benefit of the oil and gas industry. I think that we are having an incomplete conversation in this space. Um, we are talking about the jobs that people have. We're you know, talking about the you know, tax dollars that might be invested in a community. But if we aren't so also talking about the $400 billion that we are estimated to have to spend to defend our coastlines, if we aren't talking about the $886 billion of healthcare costs associated with oil and gas operations, we are having an incomplete conversation. So thank you very much um, for your question. I think that people living in communities have a vision for economic uh, prosperity, for um, health prosperity. Um, we must ensure that people are at the table um, designing those projects um, to ensure that it's reflective of um, um, the lived experience that they've had. Um, we've been traveling around the country um, asking uh, officials in the federal government to meet with communities and, and local and state leaders. And people have shovel-worthy projects that they are ready to have deployed in their communities. And if we have folks at the table contributing to that ideation, that decision-making process, we will get the best result from our investment in both of those spending bills. Thank you. To my colleagues, I want to say we need an honest conversation about permitting and the implementation of NEPA in the 21st century. And this is going to mean we need a meaningful bipartisan collaboration. We can accelerate deployment by becoming much more efficient and predictable, predictable with clear timelines. We can expedite permit review by rebuilding staff capacity in the federal agencies. We can ensure local communities have meaningful and timely input and retain the right to judicial relief when the federal government gets it wrong. And we can end, and then I'll stop, Mr. Chairman, but I really want to work with you on this because it's key to everything. We can end the environmental injustices of sacrifice zones by evaluating the cumulative impacts of projects in the communities already overburdened with unhealthy levels of pollution. We can do all of this without rolling back bedrock environmental and health protection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. General ladies, time has expired, and I appreciate the offer to work across the aisle and the recognition that the uh, we need to streamline, we need to do something different and do something better uh, going forward. And I recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Tiffany, the chairman of the Federal Land Subcommittee for five minutes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I take that as a guarantee that the Inflation Reduction Act is going to speed up NEPA because we're going to have a lot more bodies in the agencies. That's what I'm hearing out there is that we've got a guarantee that with more bodies, we are going to see NEPA speed up. Mrs. Johnson, Mrs. Johnson um, you cite in here some of the costs, one in five deaths worldwide, more than 10 million deaths per year as a result of um, various um, um, cancers, things like that. When you do your analysis of trade-offs in your organization, do you look at trade-offs? Do you look at lives that are saved as a result of having affordable energy? 
So we consider the economic, the health, the environmental impacts of policies and practices when we are evaluating their efficacy. So in regards to that, so for example, the life expectancy in the United States of America since 1900, it was about early 50s, 52 years old, something like that. It's now in its mid 70s. Is that considered? Um, infant mortality was one in 10 um, in the year 1900. It's now like seven in 1000, something like that. Um, it could have changed a little bit over the years. Um, are those things taken into account? Because affordable energy was part of the reason that um, those great advances were taken or were made. Um, does your analysis take into account the good things that happen also when assessing trade-offs? So again, we look holistically at situations. Um, to go back um, in time, as you've done, we also look at the impact of land, loose, land use decisions like redlining, like so decisions that we make to center people in undesirable areas. I really to appreciate To center I really, oil and gas operations in I really, places I really appreciate where people that. live and build on top of it Ms. Johnson, without consideration hold it. Just, I have, of I, I have the, a really limited amount of time, only get five minutes to ask mm -hmm. questions. If you would show me your analysis, just send it to my office, all the things that you put into your analysis, we would love to see that. Who's not following the NEPA process? You said that you're not getting, being able to put input in and stuff like that. There needs to be greater input. Um, that's required in the NEPA process. Who is not following the NEPA process that we should really get after here um, because they're not allowing the input that should be allowed? Can you name a project where they, they are not following the NEPA process of proper input? So I have a list here which I am happy to share with you. If you would share that. 12 with projects where the NEPA process was not followed. If you, would do the, if you would do that, I would really appreciate it. I'd love to see that. Did you, you mention the Navajo tribe um, and that there were concerns there in your opening testimony. Did you read, you perhaps don't have this um, documentation, but in our next panel, we're gonna have a group um, that's gonna talk about mining and there's gonna be a group from the Navajo tribe that is talking about the great things that mining have done, done uh, for their tribe. Obviously there's trade-offs. Um, would you like to see that testimony about the good things that are happening as a result of mining with the Navajo tribe? So I think what you are raising here is a principle of environmental justice, and that is self-determination. But people have to be at the table so final in order and to they, contribute to that kind clearly, of decision making. They were clearly at the table, and they still and are. So final if, question. If it results final in question, what you are uh, Final question, Ms. Johnson. Then is, absolutely. Do you take any, does your group take any uh, organization, take any money from the organization called Sea Change? I have no awareness of that. Okay. Do you know if any money your organization gets goes back to, we understand that there are Russian and Chinese dollars that are going into some environmental organizations. Do you know if, have you tracked that at all to see if your organization has taken any money? I have no awareness of that. Okay. Well, uh, it's important to be aware of that. Uh, I want to turn to Mr. Sandberg. Um, and number two, in regards to reforms of NEPA, you said establish a lead agency to spearhead environmental reviews. There's not a lead agency for environmental reviews? I think, thank you for the question. I think that we need to strengthen the ability of a lead agency to drive all the various members of the federal family toward conclusion. And I think that's one of the process reforms that could be important as part of this permitting reform process. We're so we don't have a lead agency. I, that actually was, is actually news to me and uh, uh, very unfortunate. Uh, Mr. Melito, uh, will the USA be fossil fuel free in 10 years? No. Why not? Because we're going to rely upon oil and natural gas for decades to come. Uh, we're going to see a huge increase in the use of renewables, but the oil and gas um, portion of our energy portfolio is also going to continue to rise substantially. So the American people should be disabused of this notion that we're going to end fossil fuel use in 10 years. Absolutely. That's, that's not reality. I yield. Gentlemen, the time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Kamala Gurdov. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much for always pronouncing my name correctly. 
Um, so many of my colleagues across the aisle have discussed increasing our dependence on fossil fuels, and all of our districts are impacted by the effects of climate change 12 months out of the year, as well as our dependence on fossil fuels. I don't think science cares if you're a Republican, a Democrat, or an independent. My diverse, largely black and brown district is home to one of the largest oil fields in the country. Instead of working to bring environmental justice to communities such as mine who have been negatively impacted by our dependence on fossil fuels, we are discussing expanding the practices that have caused serious health problems for these communities. Ms. Johnson, I have a question for you. We know that pollution in all its forms has an unacceptable and disproportionate burden on black and low-income communities like those in my district. Although one of my colleagues just yesterday from across the aisle said that because the black population is so small, it doesn't matter if we are killed by pollution. Whites and Cajuns are of greater concern. With all due respect, I think black people are important and black and low-income communities are forced to continue to bear the brunt of a changing climate, from heat islands and drought to difficulty obtaining disaster assistance. Now our colleagues are pushing for even more fossil fuel development that would only add to these risks and potentially kill more of us. So could you answer how this would impact vulnerable communities across the country? Sure. Um, I, I first want to note, I do believe that the White House Council on Environmental Quality is the lead agency around NEPA. I think it's important for us to be sure that their contributions to the rulemaking process um, is acknowledged. So to answer your question, I think in every stage of oil and gas life cycle from extraction to distribution, um, there are negative impacts on communities across the U.S., um, as I noted earlier, because of redlining and other land use decisions, we most feel that in places where people of color and people of low income live. Um, I think specifically um, environmental uh, justice communities are a part of that, that process. We experience water con contamination um, during the refinement and distribution of oil and gas. Toxic pollutants are emitted into our air and all of the, um, the health impacts that I noted earlier um, are a part of that. Um, and so I think that we need to ensure that we aren't continuing to perpetuate those disproportionate harms. Um, we need to look at how we equitably and justly transition our energy economy in a way that is affordable, but also um, um, is done at a pace where, you know, frankly, people feel comfortable that they do have family sustaining wages, that they do um, have their credentials and their education considered um, in, you know, setting um, labor standards and, and wage opportunities. Um, we need to be sure that we are preserving people's pensions and things so that that transition occurs um, in a meaningful way. Um, so I think I'll stop there. I hope I answered your question. Yes, you did. Thank you. And uh, a question was asked about which, um, uh, uh, where the NEPA process was not followed. I think you said there were 12 projects where it was, and I have a little bit of time. Would you like to share uh, what some of those projects are and what can be done to help them do what they're supposed to do? Sure. I think um, what I, I wanted to offer up is when the NEPA process was not followed, the federal requirements were not followed, we saw places like oil and gas leases in um, New Mexico um, for the, the San Juan Basin not considered climate impacts in the NEPA process, and that slowed it down. When we look at a federal coal moratorium in California, um, not taking into account um, NEPA analysis slowed down th that project's process. When we look at leases in Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, inadequate NEPA processes um, that did not consider greenhouse gas emissions from, from drilling and downstream use slowed down projects. Um, we see more of this in different places across the country. When we don't follow our process, we delay projects. The framework is not the delay. 
Thank you, Mr. John Ms. Johnson. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Montana, Mr. Rosendale, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for assembling this panel. It's a very informative group here today. Um, I'd like the representative from Oregon, prior to uh, arriving here, I was responsible for regulating an agency myself, the Securities and Insurance uh, Agency in Montana, and I discovered a lot of subjective language. Uh, which lent itself to the delays and increased costs, not only for business, but that translates into increased costs for the consumers as well. I do think that the clarification of necessary rules and the repeal or elimination of rules that merely generate paperwork is extremely helpful. And I did so when I was the insurance commissioner in the state of Montana. Um, Ms. Gamma, thank you so much for coming here today. I appreciate it. Uh, in Montana, we have so much untapped potential when it comes to undeveloped energy resources, particularly in oil and gas sector. Much of this stems from the reason that you've outlined in your testimony, namely overregulation and significant NEPA delays. The BLM's nearly unlimited discretion when it comes to and I quote, every lease permit and any other oil and natural gas decision on federal lands has made it close to impossible to actually break ground on any of these projects. I'm currently working with this committee in consultation with partners in the private sector to introduce a bill, as you say, to clarify leasing uh, minerals. Uh, that interior must hold quarterly lease sales where the lands are available. My question for you regarding that is what else, in your opinion, is the agency likely to come back with to slow down or stop this process as leasing does not necessarily translate into permitting and production? Yeah, right now we're seeing a situation of um, the Interior Department is ignoring its obligations under the Mineral Leasing Act, so I appreciate language to clarify that quarterly actually means quarterly. But they're now using their justification as the Inflation Reduction Act, which is great because at least they have an incentive to lease oil and gas because wind and solar permits are tied to it. But they're starting to play games with the numbers. So the IRA is very clear on you know, 50% of lands nominated need to come up for sale before a wind and solar permit can be issued. But they're playing games on how to count that. And so I don't want to get into the weeds on that, but I do appreciate that you're willing to clarify that language. Sure. In your so, so as this goes directly to how else can they uh, block our every move here and continue to keep American energy from reaching its full potential and force us to rely on these, these foreign entities? Well, we're proud that we produce it more sustainably on public lands than anywhere else because there's so much more regulation and process on public lands. So when we don't produce it from federal lands, um, we're getting it from overseas or somewhere else where it's not done as sustainably. Very good. As a follow-up to that, turning now to reforming NEPA delays and the extremely litigious and effective nature of, of these organizations against this industry regarding NEPA, uh, you mentioned in your testimony that about 6,000 leases are currently being defended due to increased greenhouse gas NEPA analysis. 6,000. Furthermore, you highlight that Congress has not passed any law requiring a carbon budget or the social cost of carbon, yet these leases are still being held up uh, to the NEPA process regarding this criteria. So my question here is very similar to the first one. How can we anticipate and prevent NEPA, the NEPA process, from continuing to be weaponized against those who try to acquire leases for energy resource development and any NEPA clarification that we pass? I think um, legislation that would clearly state what type of greenhouse gas analysis is necessary if, if, you know, because it's very easy right now in court to get a judge to say not enough greenhouse gas analysis was done. And BLM is struggling with this. So the project or the NEPA that uh, Ms. Johnson mentioned regarding leasing, that wasn't because the NEPA wasn't followed or public didn't have input. That's a miscarriage 
characterization of NEPA. It's because it's almost impossible not to get a judge to find that there's some deficiency in the NEPA. So no matter how hard um, and how much BLM studies it, environmental groups are going to continue to sue on greenhouse gas analysis until the analysis results in an answer that says absolutely no oil and gas should be developed because greenhouse gas emissions are created. I mean, we all know that using oil and natural gas creates greenhouse gas emissions, but until there's an alternative that does everything that oil and gas does, just using NEPA to say no greenhouse gas emissions can be um, emitted from a project that, that's not reality. That's shutting down our sources of energy um, using the NEPA process. So uh, judges can find deficiencies in the NEPA. It gets sent back to BLM to redo that analysis. And we're working with BLM to get that analysis to a place where it can be. Sorry for the long. That's okay. Th thank you very much, Ms. Scala. And uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Gentlemen, as time has expired, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New Mexico, Ms. Stansberry. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to welcome our panelists, and in particular, I want to welcome Ms. Johnson. Um, I just witnessed an exchange, and I wanted to just take a point of personal privilege here and say that we're grateful that you're here. It takes a lot of courage for members of the public to come and testify in front of this body, and I want to remind my colleagues that this is the people's house, not the lobbyist's house. Okay, and that we should really treat uh, members of the public who come before this body with the due respect that they deserve as they come before this body. So this topic is very personal to me. Um, I grew up in a working family, and many people do not know this, but my parents were both energy workers. In fact, my mom was one of the very first women operating engineers in the state of New Mexico and operated heavy equipment and helped build the San Juan Generating Station, which is the coal-fired power plant that is under energy transition in northwestern New Mexico and that many of our Diné Navajo community members work at. My father was an oil and gas welder who worked in the oil fields for some of the companies whose lobbyists, I'm sure, are here in this audience today. And when the bottom dropped out of the oil and gas industry in the early 1980s, my parents had to leave Farmington, New Mexico and move to Albuquerque, which is why I grew up in the city. Because this industry rises and falls on boom and bus cycles, and our working families, our working people, and our communities pay the price for the profits that these industries skim off the top as we ride that wave. And so as I have taken this role as a member of Congress, as a former legislator, and as an American, as a New Mexican who cares deeply about my communities, I see one of my primary responsibilities as ensuring that our communities can make a just and equitable transition, that they have opportunities and investments and a seat at the table so that they are able to participate and not just be subject to the energy industry. So as I take um, my role as ranking member in oversight, I am hoping to elevate the voices of our communities, to provide opportunities for people who are from our communities to come and testify and participate in these hearings, for the voices of our working people to actually have a seat at the table after decades of not being able to participate in the process. Now, NEPA and permitting is a very select slice of what it means to have energy democracy, as Ms. Johnson has talked about in her testimony. So I really want to take this opportunity to lay out a vision for what we can do through this body to lift up our communities, to help foster a just transition, to implement the largest investment in climate action ever in the history of this country that this body passed in August of this year, which will make billions of dollars in investments in our communities and help create millions of jobs in states like mine. And if we are smart and if we are just and if we are equitable and we actually pull those chairs around the table and involve our communities in that work, we will have a just, equitable transition that gives people a sustainable life and a sustainable economy. I also plan, of course, through my role on oversight, 
to meet our trust and treaty obligations to our tribes, to work on public lands and water issues, and to address, of course, the drought that is impacting communities across the West. Because we are in the people's house, because this is what we were elected to do. This is why we are here. So I want to take this opportunity to ask Ms. Johnson once more, I know you've already shared many of your thoughts, can you please share with us your vision and how you see this body can help to empower communities to make a just and equitable transition as we are building a new energy economy? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the acknowledgement and your question. I think because of the rich resources that this body um, holds, our public lands, um, it's really critical and important that as you shape um, policies and practices related to that, that you, as I noted, um, center environmental justice in those considerations, in those deliberations, and go back to those three questions that I mentioned. Are you um, advancing an energy source or expanding an energy source that creates harm in communities? Um, expands racially disproportionate economic, uh, racial and economic impacts, and harms communities. I think if you keep those three questions at the forefront of what you're doing, um, we will get to that future that you described in your comments. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. And Mr. Chair, thank you for having this hearing, and I yield back. Thank you. Gentlelady yields back. The Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Colorado, Ms. Bobert, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, there, there is a, a rise and fall in our communities, as Ms. Stansbury um, pointed out, but it's not just because of the oil and gas industry and the ebbs and flows of that. It's because of politicians and their bad policies that they're forcing on Americans. I know many communities um, have experienced a very large fall from the rise that they had uh, because they are being regulated into poverty. And, uh, you know, we're not subject to oil and gas. We are subject, unfortunately, to climate extremists, forcing us all to bow at the left's altar of climate change. And I'm very glad that um, Ms. Stansberry has admitted to the people here in the People's House, uh, the American people, that the Inflation Reduction Act wasn't about reducing inflation. It was the Green New Deal, a con game. Title it one way, do another thing. Spend money another way. It wasn't to reduce inflation, it was the Green New Deal. You know, back home in Colorado, I've seen firsthand the harm leftist policies have created in my communities. Colorado's Western Slope used to have a booming energy production. We used to have about 112 rigs operating on the Western Slope, and now we have four. Extreme leftist policies lock up land, they've driven away good paying American jobs, and have helped drive up gas prices. With the stroke of his pen, Joe Biden waged an all-out war against American energy production, propping up Vladimir Putin on day one of his administration from shutting down the Keystone XL pipeline, imposing new rules to block pipeline projects, canceling oil and gas leases on millions of acres of land in Alaska and in the Gulf of Mexico, imp imposing a moratorium on new federal oil and gas leases on federal lands, failing to meet the statutory deadlines uh, for quarterly lease sales, and took countless other anti-energy measures that have contributed to increased gas prices and inflation reaching record levels. Rather than shutting down production here at home and begging Iran and Venezuela and OPEC to produce energy for us, we should be producing it right here and relying on the American roughneck, the hardworking American roughneck that you are taking food out of their children's mouths to prop up your energy scams. We do it cleaner and better than anyone else. Now, my first question, thank you, witnesses, for being here today, is for you, Ms. Uh, Sagama. Thank you for traveling from Colorado to be with us. You discussed the increased bureaucracy around lease suspensions and permit extensions. What can we in Congress do to ensure that these agencies spend their time reducing the current ABT, a, APD backlog, which sits at almost 5,000, versus 
haggling over these paperwork exercises? I appreciate the question. Um, you know, just specify the, that an APD term is for four years instead of two. Because right now, when we try to get an extension, um, we're having to justify it quarterly. So it's a lot of extra paperwork churn. So just make the term four. Thank you. Ms. Sagama, we've heard um, rumblings that the Bureau of Land Management may suspend approving all APDs um, due to the Tenth Circuit's decision last Friday. In your opinion, does the BLM need to do this? Or is there a way to address this decision quickly and allow APD approvals? Yeah, it's really easy to find a NEPA deficiency in court. And in this case, um, the judge found that BLM didn't consider a carbon budget. There's no law passed by Congress that requires a carbon budget. Um, but BLM could quickly explain that, no, we didn't consider a carbon budget for because of that reason I just specified. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an easy corrective NEPA fixed. It shouldn't be affecting any other permits in New Mexico or anywhere else. That does sound like an easy fix, Ms. Sagama. Now, in your testimony, you touch on the 9,000 unused lease permits, um, leases and permits numbered um, used by the Biden administration last year when blaming producers for high energy prices. Could you explain, please, to us here today uh, why these leases and permits cannot simply be used? Well, you're never going to operate on 100% of leases. So right now we're at a 66% utilization rate, and so that's a good high number. So if there's about 12,000 non-producing leases, um, there are 23,000 producing leases. So um, that's a good mix, uh, just because sometimes economic resources are not found on a particular lease. When it comes to permits, it's there are other approvals that are necessary for permits, and we have several held up in court cases. So there are various reasons that a permit doesn't get used immediately. Thank you very much, Ms. Sagama, and thank you so much to the other witnesses for being here. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Levin, for five minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I promise I feel better than I sound. I, I, uh, my voice has been gone since last night, but I, I do genuinely look forward to working with you, finding areas of common ground here in the new Congress. I know that uh, we won't agree on everything, but I do know that uh, there will be things that we can agree on. Uh, thank you for the Arkansas spring water as well. That did not go unnoticed. Uh, but I really wanted to, to take a minute and discuss how uh, we can responsibly and sustainably deploy energy on our public lands. I agree that we need to do that. And I, as we've discussed today, public lands and waters are, are managed for multiple uses, energy development, mining, recreation, and grazing. But I believe strongly that we have this opportunity uh, to focus not on more record profits for the oil and gas industry for, that, for, for, the, for its own sake, but instead uh, to actually prioritize our public lands for purposes that spur on the renewable energy development we're going to need in, in the coming decades. Uh, and uh, I would hope that uh, we could all come together to do that. We, we've got to minimize conflicts. We've got to support timely decision making. And we've got to engage in very important land use planning as part of a smart siting effort to identify areas of high renewable energy potential and the lowest environmental friction. And, and this is all bipartisan policy, and it has been since I've been in Congress. We can responsibly improve the permitting process for clean energy and climate solutions. We can also ensure the meaningful engagement of environmental justice communities. And I, I share uh, the comments of my friend from New Mexico and, and applauding your being here. Uh, it's why I introduced something called the Public Land Renewable Energy Development Act in the last two Congresses, uh, or PLORIDA for short. It would codify a smart from the start approach to renewable energy development, and it includes measures to facilitate investment in high quality renewable sources to ensure fair revenue for, imported, or for impacted communities and to minimize impacts to wildlife and to cultural sites. Uh, Mr. Sandberg, and again, for, forgive my voice, I'm, I'm grateful for ACP support on Plurida. Could you discuss how the legislation would help increase clean energy on public lands while still maintaining thorough environmental and community protections? Thank you for the question. And, and as you've outlined, uh, Plurida is, uh, is, a, is a, a great first step to help us develop renewables on federal lands. And as you said, focusing on high quality resources and low impact areas. So mitigating wildlife impacts, cultural sites, those types of things. And I think that this bipartisan effort can 
yield um, good results. As you know, and as we've discussed with your office, um, since 2015, there's been a, a very little development, renewable development on federal lands, while there's been a boom um, on private lands. And so I think there is a, a great ability and opportunity to uh, expedite and, and use those resources on federal lands. And one of the core principles of the legislation is smart from the start planning. Um, do you agree that's the best planning approach for balancing renewable energy with all the other uses uh, of our public lands, and, and if so, why? So we, we support many of the, the provisions in your bill, and, and, all, and as part of that, I think that this permitting process and the, pro the processes laid out in Florida are an, a fantastic first step in that process, and we look forward to working with you in this Congress to advance those. Appreciate that very much, and I would just close, Mr. Chairman, uh, by saying we can spend the next two years yelling and screaming at each other and focusing on all that we disagree about. I don't think it's the best use of our time. I don't think it's what our constituents expect, and I think it's incumbent on every one of us here to find areas of common ground and try to move the ball forward in a positive way for our country. So with that, I'll yield back. Sorry, Katchen, transition. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Bentz, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank the witnesses for being here. Uh, I think this question eventually will be for Ms. Sagama, but let me just go through uh, some uh, language out of a report regarding the, uh, the, the $1 billion that's been thrown at our permitting difficulties, and it seems odd that anybody would, dis would dispute that we have permitting difficulties when when we threw a billion dollars at it to try to fix it. But uh, this language uh, out of out a report from Bloomberg says the problem isn't going to get fixed by throwing money at it. Uh, Mario Loyola, now senior fellow at Competitive Enterprise, Enterprise Institute, the problem is structural. It's not that we don't have enough people, it's that the permitting process is insane. This little potpourri of odds and ends and these little baskets of money are way too little, way too late. Uh, I guess my, my first question is, true or false? We've got a billion dollars. It was suggested by the ranking member that, that, that the, the problem has been addressed. Has it been addressed in a way that's going to make a difference? I'm asking that you got a question. Oh, I mean, as far as throwing money at it, like, I agree with you. It's, it's about making the parameters of NEPA sane and, and focusing it on the task at hand. And, and how would, and, and I understand that under the Trump administration, there, there were steps taken to try to help, and those were then reversed when the Obama administration, excuse me, when the Biden administration took over. So uh, what should be done? And I know this is the third time you've been asked the question, but. No, no, no problem. I appreciate the question. Um, really focus NEPA on the impacts from the project, not, you know, 10 years of uh, studies on air impacts, you know, 200 miles away, or um, it's got to be the, the, the impacts of the project. And it needs to be a tight time frame and a an uh, of an and making NEPA documents so that the average person can read them and understand what's in right. them. So it's, it's long been my thought in, in watching these processes that they have become politicalized, and thus it's no big surprise that there would be a 10-year delay on a oil uh, or fossil fuel development. But it's, is it uh, is it your thought that we're going to see less delay when it comes to a uh, a green energy project? <laughs> you would think so, um, based on how politically favored wind and solar are. But no, they're facing the si same kinds of issues we are in the oil and gas industry. Now, it's not hugely surprising, given that given the opportunity to litigate uh, and delay and do all the stuff you can do with with NEPA, which is a fertile field for we lawyers that choose to engage in those kinds of activities. Do you think this billion dollars in some fashion can be used to try to head off some of, some of that delay? I'm on the Judiciary Committee. I often think we should be looking at means of, of, of reducing the delay opportunities inside civil procedure, for example. I think it would probably take other legislation because right now judges are just, you can take a 5,000 page NEPA document and you can find a judge that's gonna say, oh wait, this analysis here wasn't done quite the way it should have been done. Yeah. Forget that it's highly complex. Let me, let me hop to some of the suggestions that, are, uh, that I've read about how, what we might do in, in, all, in the alternative to that, which we now have. One is, uh, is pre-approval of project sites. Another is 
uh, competitive net zero grants to states. A third is federal energy corridors. Now, federal energy corridors leads me to, to calling something out that people seem to ignore, and that is the incredible cost of green energy when it comes to transmission. And I, I don't want to say I'm amused. I, I think I'm dis, d discouraged by the fact that if, you're going, if we're going to have a clean energy future, it means that our nation is going to be crisscrossed with all kinds of 500K kilowatt, you know, power lines. Uh, I've had one run through my district back in Oregon. Uh, 15 years, 15 years to permit, no surprise, nobody wants a 500 kV line going through their backyard. So I'm just curious though, why don't we hear more from the green energy advocates about this cost? Because it is a cost, I guarantee it, when you suddenly turn a, a bucolic, uh, in, you know, a rural neighborhood into an industrial transmission site. So what's your thoughts there? Do you think that this uh, federal energy corridors is a good idea? I'm not as familiar, familiar as, um, with that because I, I'm, I focus, my producers are at the, just the wellhead, but I think Mr. Sandberg maybe could answer that question better Sandberg, than Sandberg, we have 20 seconds. You have 20 seconds, you have 15. 14, 13. <laughs> <laughs> I think that transmission build out is important, not just to clean energy, but to all generation sources. I think we need more of it. Uh, I do agree that there are common sense reforms that are, can be part of this package that can expedite the permitting of those uh, projects. Uh, thank you. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Florida. Ms. Luna, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. The Biden administration has launched a war on energy, which really means a war on the resources that Americans need to live productive, meaningful lives. We need to do, produce more domestic oil, natural gas, and nuclear energy. These natural resources are the bounty of our nation and should be responsibly extracted for the benefit of the American people. Increased production keeps energy costs low, supports good paying jobs, and advances American energy independence from foreign nations and strengthens our national security. Unfortunately, since day one, President Biden has chosen to punish Americans, first by revoking the permit for the Keystone Pipeline, which could have supplied the U.S. with over 830,000 barrels of oil per day. According to the Bureau of Land Management, there are currently 4,609 permits for drilling on federal lands that await this administration's approval. Many of these can be approved today, allowing companies to move forward with oil development. In addition, there are 8,295 outstanding approved permits that are unable to be developed due to the administration's regulatory framework that has constrained oil and gas production, which is very telling based on his speech last night. Maximizing energy production in America will limit the need to import from other nations, reduce high energy costs, create jobs domestically, and in my opinion, protect the environment. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to insert these graphics into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Ms. Sagama, are the Biden administration's policies having the effect of increasing energy abundance or constraining our nation's energy portfolio? I would say it's constraining. Mr. Sandberg, which kind of countries develop and innovate more clean power solutions, prosperous ones or poor ones? I think the innovation is led mostly by the developed world. Thank you. It's clear that the Biden administration and radical left want to impoverish Americans with pushing energy costs, but let's talk about who they're rewarding. Behind me, you guys can see a chart, and it has China leading the world in the highest CO2 emissions. In fact, China's 2021 emissions were about equal to the emissions of the US, EU, and India combined. In 2021, China consumed about 44,000 terawatt hours of energy with 0.26 kilograms of CO2 per kilowatt per hour, while the U.S. consumed 26,000 terawatt hours of energy with 0.19 kilograms of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Ms. Johnson, your testimony calls for considering cumulative impacts of greenhouse gas emissions. Are you aware that China emissions would be more than double the U.S., and does Chinese CO2 molecules not count towards a cumulative impact on our planet? That's not a question I feel capable of answering. I'm asking you that, though, because with your opinion, which I do respect, we're talking about how we can best, I think, preserve our community and the environment. And when we send our production and our oil overseas, when we are enabling countries with foreign policy that are destroying the planet, I think that it's very applicable to this committee. So please answer the question. 
It's not a question that I feel capable of answering. According to the chart behind me, since you don't want to comply, China is destroying our environment. Our current foreign policy is enabling China, and it's clear that with this administration, that for those who are advocating for climate justice, that are those who are advocating for climate change, are failing to acknowledge that they are empowering through foreign policy and through an administration that is limiting our ability here in the United States to produce clean energy. They are empowering a country that is going to destroy us all. Thank you, Chairman. I yield my time. Chairman, lady yields back. Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Wyoming, Ms. Hageman, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, and thank you to all of you for being here today. Ms. Sagama, thank you for your testimony today and for representing our Western states. I want to focus on one specific part of your written testimony because I think it carries the most weight. You state that when the federal regulation and, and, and process becomes unbalanced with the goal of producing the energy the Interior Department manages on behalf of all Americans, then we have a situation where the federal government is purposely preventing federal production, resulting in higher prices for consumers, more foreign imports, less energy security, et cetera. What you are describing is energy poverty. Energy poverty imposed on the American people by a burdensome federal structure which Joe Biden has weaponized. Nearly half of Wyoming is owned by the federal government, as is over 60% of its mineral estate. When Joe Biden weaponizes his control of federal lands, he is targeting Wyoming and the Americans we serve. Wyoming produces 13 times more energy than it consumes and is the second biggest net energy supplier among the 50 states. I think one of the biggest disconnects for Washington, D.C. and Americans not from the West is to truly understand how substantial the federal presence in our community is and the impact it has on developing the resources we have, which the nation so relies upon. Americans are facing the most expensive heating bills in 25 years. Food prices are up 10% from the previous year. Gas prices in November 22 were the highest ever, and nearly 34% of American households reduced or skipped basic expenses to pay energy bills. Do you, have a, do you have similar statistics for the cost of Biden administration's policies on energy producers? Well, I think um, there was a study done that showed we would be producing two to three million more barrels a day in the United States now if President Trump's policies had been followed and not President Biden's. And that equates to us having to spend, uh, send $100 billion overseas so that we can get energy in to make up for that difference. So it's much better to produce it here. And if you look at where oil and gas is produced in Wyoming and across the West, it is certainly in remote areas, not near uh, disadvantaged communities. So we also have that added benefit in Wyoming. Thank you. And would you agree that this forced energy, that this is forced energy poverty on the American people and producers? Well, I think if these goals are ultimately brought to their conclusion, it would re result in more energy scarcity. Um, people are trying to electrify everything and get rid of natural gas. And if you take that policy to its conclusion, then when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, we don't have electricity. So that's scarcity. That's not being able to run your ICU. That's not being able to turn the lights on. Um, so that has a lot of ramifications beyond if these policies were taken to the ultimate conclusion. I, I believe that Americans are not um, going to let that happen, though. Well, the reality is, is that energy security is national security. Affordable energy is the key to our prosperity. Affordable energy is key to affordable housing and affordable food production. Increasing the cost of energy affects our poorer communities the most. It is in reality a terribly regressive tax imposed by those who can most easily afford it and who don't suffer its consequences. The bottom line for me, I believe that there is a special place in hell for those people who push policies that are intended to increase the cost of housing, food, and energy. I yield back. Did the gentlelady yield back? Yes, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. LaMalfa, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As a uh, committee hop here, uh, 
go from uh, Waters of the United States uh, regulations over in the uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Committee to figuring out what to do about NEPA. It seems it's just about every angle possible to stop people from doing what they need to do, even though they know how to do it ecologically soundly pretty much these days. So let me launch into a thought here on, um, I know we're covering very good ground on energy and on mineral extraction and such, Ex extremely important. I'd also like to uh, hit a related area, at least uh, to me as well, in Northern California are, are forest management and what NEPA's effect is on that. So um, let me maybe pose this to uh, Dana Johnson here as our witness on um, NEPA being used as a tool basically to delay very important forest service thinning projects, um, timber harvest, things that are important for the local economy, for local forest health, simple, simple things in a forested area of replacing a, uh, a pipe, replacing a culvert so that a forest road could be maintained and, and utilized for many purposes. Um, what, what do you think the really, when you, when you look at that on, on the NEPA being required for a culvert and every simple thing, what, what do you think are the real consequences for these delays on the people of my district that have just suffered a million acre fire in 2021 and the uh, camp fire which destroyed the town of Paradise in 2018, the Bear Fire uh, nearly adjacent to Paradise destroyed two very small mountain communities. What, um, when we're talking about the reforms that were proposed back in 2020, uh, is uh, NEPA in the right place now or 2020 type of reforms reasonable in the context of what we're doing to our forest in the mountain communities? So my area of expertise is not in forestry and mountain communities, but I will broadly say that a NEPA that does not provide opportunity for public comment periods, that doesn't proactively consider alternatives in environments, doesn't consider cumulative impacts, doesn't consult um, with those who are, are impacted is a NEPA that does not work for people and does not work for communities. Well, it seems the people that are uh, wanting this consultation aren't living in the communities that are burning down upon the people's heads there, like Greenville and Canyon Dam and Paradise and Megalia, Concal, Yankee Hill. They, come, they seem to come from somewhere else. They bring lawyers in, in from the coast and stop decent uh, timber harvest projects, or as more, more uh, pertinent to the topic here as well, that uh, mineral extraction we're going to need in this country to keep up with the mandates that are coming for replacing all types of fuel with electricity. Electricity stoves being the latest, latest one, getting rid of uh, uh, all matter of yard tools and, and such. So is, is NEPA going to be helpful in uh, having uh, the voices of so many overwhelming the rural voices that live in these areas where the minerals extracted, where the timber is needing to be thinned? So NEPA is a place-based policy. It takes a look at, it assesses a project in the place where it will be implemented. Um, I can't speak to where people are coming from in defense of that. But if applied appropriately, NEPA would take into account the people living in the rural communities that you are um, uplifting. Yeah, so frequently it does not. It uh, runs over them. Uh, for Kathleen Sagama, um, has looking at uh, back to the energy grid, and it, everything involves energy. It's so important. It's a cornerstone. It's why the cost of everything has gone up so much as we've stopped developing energy, and energy costs have skyrocketed so much for gasoline, diesel, natural gas, even electricity as they try to take out hydroelectric dams in my district, one of them being in Mr. Benz's district, and, and, and getting rid of the supply of electricity. Uh, from your perspective, has the Biden administration found any way to be helpful in energy production or the manufacturing? We have seen uh, purposeful obstacles put in place of oil and natural gas development. I, I would guess they're being helpful to wind and solar. Yeah, it's, I guess it's hard to find. Um, well, Mr. Chairman, I've already run myself out of time, so I'll have to pop to it at a different time. Thank you, sir.
Gentleman yields back his one second. The chair recognizes the ranking member uh, for five minutes, Mr. Grijalva. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks to all the witnesses for uh, for participating today. Uh, Mr. Gama, let me just uh, a quick question. Do you see in the portfolio of uh, uh, unleashing America's energy and mineral potential per the, per the agenda for this meeting, do you see as part of that portfolio, unleashing portfolio, do you see royalty relief for uh, gas and oil as one of those items that needs to be considered by Congress? We believe in paying a fair share of royalties. Absolutely, we pay royalties. Uh, we're very proud to provide that um, royalty back to the American taxpayer. So relief is not on the agenda from the... No, no. That's good to know because that will be one less item that we have to deal with. Uh, the other issue I was going to ask is... Uh, uh, Ms. Jo Ms. Johnson, and thank you, and good to see you again. Um, we've talked a lot about and, and the questions that have been directed at, at, at you, and I think you've more than informed all of us as to not only we act, but the issue of environmental justice, and, and, uh, and that it must be front and center. My question is that all the impacts, health, lack of participation, systemic land use decision that leads to discriminatory practices at other levels uh, for, for the communities that you represent and you speak for. My question is uh, the economic issue. It's been brought up in every other conversation here. But let's talk about the economic issue and your experience relative to the communities that we're talking about and that you represent, frontline communities, What's that economic reality for those neighborhoods and those, those communities? Yeah, I think that the economic reality is that we have higher um, health costs in those communities. Um, we see reduced um, number of school days and work days associated with health um, impacts. We see environmental degradation that leads to lower property values. Um, we see people not making um, a, a wage um, that is appropriate and sustainable. Um, but on the flip side of that, I think that we see um, positive economic opportunity coming in this conversation that we are having about how do we ensure that we have a sustainable, affordable, accessible, robust energy economy? Um, to do that does not mean that we forsake projects, whether they are traditional or clean, I'm sorry, um, environmental processes, if, whether we are considering a, a traditional or a clean energy project. Again, as was mentioned, there are resources in the Inflation Reduction Act that we believe will provide staffing, that will provide um, opportunities to modernize and, and um, streamline our, our system and processes, and that we can get energy economic opportunities deployed in an equitable and just way at a proper pace because we have invested in it um, in a robust way during the 2020, um, during the previous legislative uh, session. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Sam Amberg, I just need a, a point of clarification. Uh, you stated, you said that permitting reform should not mean undercutting our environmental standards, and I, and I agree with you on that. Uh, but uh, also in, in your testimony, speaking in support of the, of TAP, America's Energy Act, uh, you support that that piece of legislation. The bill, but the bill expressly undercuts our most fundamental environmental standards. That's NEPA, the environmental, uh, the National Environmental Policy Act. It weakens requirements for assessing environmental and public health impacts in many ways, and even worse, it would exempt numerous energy projects from the NEPA uh, review. Uh, so. Well, I agree with your statement that I said earlier, I would respectfully want a clarification 
do you urge a closer look? The contradiction in uh, supporting what is essentially the gutting of NEPA in one piece of legislation and the comments that you, that you made. Thank you for the question. I think there are uh, ways uh, to make common sense reforms to NEPA. And I think that um, working with the Congress, we have faith that the Congress can do that. And I think that the TAP Act is one example. There are others out there that working with you and others, we can find a way to streamline the process without undercutting, as you said, our bedrock environmental statutes. Uh, a, a 2020 study, uh, 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 according to that 2020 study, that was uh, one out of every 450 NEPA reviews are ever challenged in court. Uh, do you consider that? Uh, do you consider that a factor in? Uh, I know that it's been exaggerated to the point that everything ends up in court and that people are, are, that NEPA is a tool to slow everything down, which is not true, but one out of every 450, you consider that too much, excessive? I think to meet our share goals of um, accelerating clean energy deployment and the economic and environmental benefits that will come from that, that there are some things that need to happen to streamline the process for permitting does that include re reach our denying people goals. the redress in court? Pardon? Does that include denying people redress in court? No, Which sir. Which is their right? It does not. Okay. Yield back, and I'm sorry. Excuse me. Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Fulcher, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to the panel, thank you for being here and for your testimony and your input. You probably know this, but just in case not, Please don't mistake our coming and going as a rudeness or, or lack of interest. It's called the dueling committees that sometime pop up on the schedule. And so I just wanted to, to clarify that and let you know you're appreciated. A question for Ms. We're Sagama. We're here. Uh, Ms. Sagama, in your written testimony, you talked about an onslaught of regulatory overreach coming. You may have already discussed this, but I'm going to ask you to touch on that again. What's coming? But we think. Personally, I think there's too much now, but uh, what should be watching, watching for? Yeah, I probably should have used a different tense. Um, yeah, absolutely. We are facing um, duplicate rulemakings right now. We just finished one up from BLM and now one with EPA. Um, the financial regulators are, we, we can't keep up with all that they're throwing at the industry meant to um, deny financing to oil and natural gas projects um, in, from Department of Labor, SEC, um, Department of Treasury, all kinds of regulations are coming out. Nobody can even keep up with it. Okay, so Committee on Natural Resources, if, uh, if, if you were king for a day, and could tell us to focus in on one particular area as a priority, what would it be? NEPA. Okay. Well, that's a good setup for the next question, because I have one for Mr. Sandberg in regard to NEPA. I'm from the state of Idaho, and so uh, if you know anything about our natural resource base there, you know that we're no stranger to NEPA. And um, you have been speaking about some potential changes to that I'm going to go down a similar path with you. First of all, where there are cumbersome components of NEPA, do you see the impact of that to be more negative from a cost standpoint or a time standpoint, first of all? And then, same question, king for a day, you can focus in on one particular area to improve it, what would it be? So two-point question, cost or time? And what's the, what's the priority that we should be going after? Well, I, I thank you for the question. I think it's both. Uh, I think it, it, it has a cost component, it has a time component, neither of which are helpful to deployment of clean energy. And so as, as I, I lead into your second part of your question, if I was king for a day, I think we just need to work on shortening. But I think if we could shorten timelines, that would be a good first step. For litigation? See, uh, litigation is a... Uh, issue? And if so, could you comment on that? I don't have a comment on litigation. Okay. All right. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Carl, for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Mr. Is it Milto? Melito. All right. I'm from South Alabama, so you got to work with me here a little bit. Uh, as you know, the Biden administration has canceled the, the three remaining leases in the Gulf uh, lease sales on the offshore five-year plan that expires June or expired June the 30th, 2022. The Bureau of Ocean Energy Management only resumed planning sales at the direction of Congress in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. BOEM has so far failed to publish any new five-year plan leaving the U.S. without a long-term plan for oil and gas production in the Gulf of Mexico, which supplies over 20% of our oil reserves. 20% is in limbo right here. Why is oil and natural gas production in the Gulf of Mexico critical to our ability to meet the growing demand and why is it necessary to continue planning for the future with regular lease sales in the Gulf? Uh, there's many reasons why production from the Gulf of Mexico is so important to Americans. First of all, it's a reliable supply of energy. We, we need to use uh, oil and gas in our economy. The global economy requires it. If you look back in 2021, uh, we were still importing oil from Russia, and uh, we hit actually 500,000 barrels a day of imports from Russia in August of 2021. Uh, on the other hand, we have the Gulf of Mexico, which is a crown jewel of energy production, and we have an opportunity to increase production from 1.8 million barrels up to 2.4 million barrels of production if we have the opportunity to move forward with leasing and permitting. Further, the Gulf of Mexico provides high paying jobs. These jobs are throughout the country, uh, mostly along the Gulf Coast, but these are um, very high paying jobs and they're not just uh, uh, college degree jobs. These are blue collar jobs that you know, are available for um, communities along the Gulf Coast. Another thing I'd like to add is that we've been supportive of revenue sharing. And if you look back at the Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act, which was passed in 2006, that law provided uh, the funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund to come from offshore oil and gas development. So we've paid through offshore oil and gas development in the Gulf over $5 billion for parks, wildlife, recreational projects throughout the country. Uh, and that's over 40,000 projects. Also, as part of that uh, fund, there's a uh, what's called the uh, what's, what's it called? The, 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 it, it's a program that is designed to send money into uh, underprivileged and, and urban areas for parks and, and, and recreation. Is that part of um, the Go Mesa money? It's, it's part of the Go Mesa money. So there's been tens of millions of dollars annually now going to uh, fund parks and recreation and wildlife programs for underprivileged communities uh, in, in urban areas throughout the country. So um, we have all these benefits, and this is a region that provides among the lowest carbon barrels of oil in the world. Uh, all U.S. production provides better oil when it comes to low carbon intensity, but the Gulf of Mexico really provides the best. Uh, so if we're going to get it, let's get it from here where we know we can secure these benefits rather than seeing that production go to other parts of the world, which harms our national security. I'm glad you touched on the Go Mesa money. I was a county commissioner for eight years, and we, we depended on the Go Mesa money. And where we actually used it was uh, 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 restoring shorelines, oyster beds, all these environmental projects that were created over time, and we were able to restore them. We actually purchased property. We've got uh, some stuff I'm thinking down on Dolphin Islands Park and Recreation. That's for the public to use. All of this is publicly used. So when you start talking about reducing the output in the Gulf, you're talking about reducing that Go Mesa money, which affects Mobile and Baldwin County. I'll speak for Alabama. It re reduces money in both of those. So it just amazes me how we will buy Russian oil, which is much dirtier, and it's got to cost more to actually get it here because we've got oil right at our back door, as well as natural gas. We have a tremendous amount of natural gas off Alabama shores. So it, it's frustrating for me as, as being a representative from the Gulf Coast and see what has happened over the last two years. We have got to get, I mean, we have so many rules and regulations. Everybody says, well, there's 7,000 leases. That's hogwash. There's 7,000 leases and 699,000, whatever, the, the breakdown of the numbers it is all tied up in permit. I mean, it, it's an environmental nightmare trying to, trying to get through all of this. But anyway, I appreciate your, your comments. I appreciate you bringing up Go Mesa. You, you kind of hit the softball for me on that one. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Chairman, return back. Thank you.
The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Virginia, Ms. Kiggins. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I represent uh, Virginia, the Eastern Shore, Virginia Beach, and um, a lot of the Chesapeake, Chesapeake Bay region. So I just, Virginians how know, to, know how to be good stewards of the environment without sacrificing jobs or hurting our economy. Not only is the Chesapeake Bay watershed home to roughly 3,600 species of plants and animals, but also provides countless economic and recreational opportunities, generating $33 billion each year. So Mr. Melito and Mr. Sandberg, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management recently announced the draft environmental impact statement for an offshore wind project off the coast of Virginia Beach, creating the potential for new job opportunities and economic growth for Virginians. The wind industry is growing along the Atlantic coast and provides opportunities to diversify our energy production. But Virginia's fishing community and tourism economy are also crucial to our economic well-being and critical military training exercises take place off our coastline. How is the wind industry engaging with and accommodating concerns of these stakeholders to ensure balanced access to the Outer Continental Shelf? Yeah, considering the balancing needs of all the different offshore industries and, and stakeholders is very important to our industry. Um, I, I do like to point to the Gulf of Mexico experience because we've been developing energy resources there for decades uh, in, in, in a compatible way with military tourism, commercial recreational fishing. So we have the experience. We've been able to do that very well. And, and we've seen that also in the development of the wind industry throughout Europe. Um, so the process that we've seen as it moved, has moved forward uh, is a collaborative process. Um, it, it's through NEPA and it's through the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act where all the different stakeholders are able to weigh in and provide their thoughts in, in a deliberative way to make sure that we're allowing all users to be able to move forward with their activities with as little interruption as possible. Uh, and, and one thing I like to point to is the industry working together to find a way to um, separate the wind turbines to the greatest extent possible um, so that there's enough space for all users, but we're also able to build up a wind farm that will provide uh, the, the wind capacity to power the grid at, at shoreside. So th there's a lot that goes into it. Um, the, the companies that are moving forward with developing these projects work closely with the communities, with the state leaders, with the federal family to make sure that we're doing everything we can to uh, address all, all the competing needs. And how is the regulatory process under NEPA impacting timelines for offshore wind leasing and construction and what can this committee do better to better the certainty in the NEPA process? I think a lot of this is going to come down to making sure we, we, we do have guide rails on the NEPA analysis to make sure that uh, we, we don't have a process that, that, that um, is never ending and that can ultimately uh, always lead to a challenge in court and depending on the judge strike down a, a project or delay it and send it back. Uh, I will say that there are also there are already multiple lawsuits filed against the um, early mover wind projects in the Atlantic. Multiple, multiple lawsuits. Uh, so there's a lot of concern about that because um, th those lawsuits could have a, a, an impact on the ones that are in line behind them depending upon uh, how they shake out. Uh, so we need to make sure that the, the, the agencies have a framework with some guide rails and we need to also look at the remedies available um, to the court to make sure that uh, we're not stifling investment and putting companies in a position to want to invest elsewhere in the world rather than here. Thank you. And Ms. Sugama, while I recognize the importance of the offshore wind industry to my district and other coastal communities, it does nothing to financially support federal conservation efforts, so unlike the oil and gas industry. As you know, the Great American Outdoors Act direct, directs roughly $1.9 billion in energy development royalties to conservation efforts across the country, including national parks and wildlife refuges, as well as permanently funding the Land and conservation, Water Conservation Fund at $900 million annually. In fact, 94% of federal conservation efforts are funded exclusively by royalties from oil and gas industry leases and production. So with the Biden administration slowing the permitting process, limiting production leases, and over-regulating the oil and gas industry, what are the expected impacts on conservation efforts over the next decade, and how can we ensure that funding remains available for the conservation of our coastal communities? I really appreciate that because I think that's something that does get lost is if if we took oil and natural gas development to zero on federal lands, that would take away that $2.8 billion, federal lands and waters, that goes into conservation with no replacement for it. Because um, right now, wind um, provides something, I think it provided like something like $5 million, um, whereas we provide 
billions of dollars. So there's no, if you took away oil and gas, that conservation funding dries up. So, so there would be none pretty much for our coastal communities for conservation efforts. I mean, if these policies were ultimately taken to their conclusion, which I don't really see happening, but yes, if, if you didn't continue to produce more on federal lands and waters, eventually that money would go to zero. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I yield back. <clears throat> General Ladies, time's expired. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Again, I want to thank the witnesses for your testimony today, and I want to circle back kind of to where I started with the chart behind me. Uh, we face uh, a challenge here in the United States. The world faces a challenge, and it goes back to this insatiable appetite for energy. And the title of today's hearing is Unleashing Energy and Mineral potential, uh, and we're talking about that potential that we have here in the U.S., and probably to the surprise of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, we're, it's not all fossil fuels that are represented uh, at the witness table today. We have uh, a fuel, uh, we have full representation of the many kinds of energy uh, that are available and that need to be developed here in the U.S., and as I've listened here and I think about the purpose of this hearing, the purpose of the hearing is to inform the committee as we prepare to write legislation or to have oversight to address the issues uh, that need to be addressed. And the word that came out probably more than any other word from both sides of the aisle was NEPA. It came out with, with all the witnesses. So we're talking about regulatory reform and when we're, it's, it's hard to talk about energy development, whether you're talking about traditional energy or energy of the future without talking about uh, regulatory, uh, the regulatory environment and the potential need to reform that regulatory environment. We have data that shows that uh, the time to get a permit ebbs and flows. Uh, it was up uh, close to 200 days on average under the Obama administration. It got down to as low as uh, 94 days on average in the Trump administration. Nothing changed in the bedrock environmental laws that we talk about. Sounds more like it's a, a will to do the job uh, that these federal employees are hired to do, and that is to permit. I come from a background of, of doing engineering projects, so I was on the other side of permitting issues, and I know how frustrating it can be when you're doing everything possible to follow the law to make sure that the public interest is protected, that the environment is protected, and yet you're totally bogged down in uh, the, the slowness of the environmental permitting process. So as we look at this, it's not about permitting for extractive industries like the fossil fuel industry. It's not about just permitting for renewable. It's about creating a process that allows America to win. And I want to ask the, the two witnesses uh, who represent both uh, fossil fuel, traditional energy, and renewable energies, do you see any kind of discrimination in the permitting process based on the type of project that's being permitted? Uh, no, I do not, sir. I believe that the uh, impediments to energy development through some of these laws are um, being applied to every energy source out there. I would agree with that. Ms. Sagama, do you uh, think that the fossil fuel industry is discriminated against in any way in the permitting process? Well, we're certainly targeted, that's for sure. <laughs> um, I don't have a perspective because I don't try to permit wind and solar. And the point's been made several times in the, the hearing today that uh, the demand for energy is not going down, it's going up. And that energy has to come from, from somewhere. And we know that if we don't produce it here in the United States, then the market is going to uh, cause us to import that energy. If the, and we're going to have another hearing on, on minerals, which gets all into the renewable energy component of it, if we don't have the ability to produce the products to do renewable energy here in the U.S., we're going to import that, which means we're exporting wealth. So as to inform the committee, and, uh, and Ms. Johnson, I appreciate your, your uh, testimony on how 
we don't need to do away with NEPA. Maybe NEPA needs to change, and there's considerations that need to be taken into that, but I don't think anybody in the hearing said we need to file a bill to do away with NEPA. As a matter of fact, Ms. Dingle, whose husband wrote NEPA, uh, she was one of the first ones to say uh, the law needs to be updated. So um, we'll start with Ms. Sagama and go across the diet or the witness table. What is the one thing you would say the committee needs to focus on in regulatory reform? Um, like I said, NEPA, but I, I think I would suggest looking at the uh, litigation angle and, and working to give judges guidance that um, endless NEPA and endless um, analysis is not the intent of NEPA. And could you could you be just a little more specific on NEPA? Is it is it a timing process? Are there flaws in the structure of NEPA that we need to change, or uh, what what is it specifically about NEPA that could make it work better? Well, when you look at litigation, it's really easy to find some analysis in a five thousand page document that could have been done better, and it's supposed to be done on the best available information, not waiting years and years for more information to come in or requiring the project proponent to go off and do a science project and come back 10 years later. So I would say constraining it to what the focus is of the impacts on the ground of that project, not hypothetical impacts 10 years in the future. Thank you. Ms. Johnson? Thank you. I would say we need to consider cumulative impact. If it was reasonable for us to consider it in the 1970s when NEPA was established or signed into law, um, industry growth and expansion make these considerations all the more pressing today. Again, it's a false narrative for us to suggest that cumulative impact analysis is too costly, that it takes too much time when we have more tools and data available today than we've ever had before and to fail to consider um, existing ha hazards along with um, potentially new ones will turn a blind eye to those who have a history, a legacy of being harmed by our energy, energy policies and practices. So your position is that we need to add more to NEPA? Is there anything you no, suggest? No, cumulative impact um, analysis is a part of the environmental um, um, assessment process and I think we need to preserve it is what I'm suggesting. So that's, a, that's an administrative rule that was not in the original NEPA document. Are you saying we should codify that? So it's a, it's a part to do an environmental assessment to consider what uh, the impact of a project in, um, in coordination with um, projects that are already on the ground is is a core it's a core part of NEPA that is already um, there it's already a part of the law we just need to be sure we're doing it thank you mr. Sandberg thank you mr. chairman I think um, a, an important and, and a great first step would just be time bounding some of the reviews uh, and I think that's a good place to start I think kind of really refocusing on purpose and need and that the review kind of centers on that is another important step but I would say for us like really, that certainty around timing is critical. Thank you, Mr. Melito. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would encourage the committee to look more broadly and outside the box a little bit and see if there's ways we can get to yes uh, faster. We have a tendency in the federal bureaucracy to look at things in silos. It's oil and gas, it's wind, it's carbon capture and storage. We have companies that are very innovative and looking to deploy large amounts of capital to build these energy projects. And an energy project might include oil and gas offshore. It might include wind. It might include carbon capture and storage. And it might include hydrogen. It might include all those as part of a major project that can help the US lead in decarbonization efforts, but also provide the energy we need today based on the foundational energy sources our economy uses. The problem is we don't have a system set up to do something like that. You either got an oil and gas project, you either got a, or a wind project, or a CCS project, or a hydrogen project. So we should work together to find ways to get the yes faster, because if you look in Europe, they can look at a project like that 
and do it much quicker in terms of getting that approved. You have 70 CCS projects that are uh, uh, under um, uh, development right now in Europe. A lot of those are offshore. Uh, we're not at that point yet because we have a bureaucracy that kind of holds things up. So that's a good point to, uh, to streamline <clears throat> the permitting for new technologies and I'm constantly encouraged by new technologies. Uh, when you talk about carbon capture, there's now technology to strip the carbon off of the carbon dioxide, release the oxygen, put the carbon in a slurry, inject it into the ground, and it solidifies into a rock. That's real carbon capture and sequestration, and we should be pushing the innovation and pushing the permitting process to be able to get new technology like that online uh, sooner than later. Again, I thank the witnesses. Uh, this concludes our first panel, and we're going to take a, a 10 minute recess. We'll start back at about a quarter till with the second panel that'll give us time to, uh, to switch out the witness table.
The committee will come to order. I will now introduce our witnesses from panel two. First, we've got Mr. Michael Holloman, commercial director and member of the board of U.S. Strategic Minerals from St. Louis, Missouri. We've got Mr. Reno Franklin, chairman of the Kashaha Band of Pomo Indians. He's a member of the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation from Santa Rosa, California. Mr. Matthew Adams, Vice President and Senior Tax Counsel from the Navajo Transitional Energy Company from Broomfield, Colorado. And I'll yield to Representative John Curtis for 30 seconds to introduce our final witness, Mr. Brian Summers, President of the Utah Mining Association. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to uh, introduce a good friend of mine, the President of the Utah Mining Association, Brian Summers, former Managing Director of Utah Science, Technology, and Research Initiative, former Deputy Director of Utah Department of Heritage and Arts, and also worked for Governor Herbert, and I think of interest to many of us, former Congressman Mia Love. Uh, Brian, thanks for being here with us today. We look forward to your testimony. We'll now hear testimony from our witnesses on panel two. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Holloman to testify for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Westerman, and thank you, Ranking Member Grijalba and the rest of the committee. Uh, thank you for having me here to uh, testify on unleashing America's energy and mineral potential. My name is Mike Holloman. I'm here representing U.S. Strategic Metals in conjunction with uh, National Mining Association. Our company, U.S. Strategic Metals, is the only primary cobalt, nickel, and nickel producer and processor, and importantly, recycler in North America. We are a green battery minerals platform that is working hard to close the final link in the supp supply chain loop that will lead us to raw materials independence as we work to meet the growing demand for renewable energy, batteries, and other high-tech applications. The timing of this discussion could not be better. Uh, America has, for all intents and purposes, leashed the energy industry. I have been all around the world. I've watched it for the last 20 years. We have effectively outsourced mining and processing. Why is this important? Because as it stands right now, we face a skyrocketing demand for renewable energy, and we do not control our own destiny as a nation for the raw materials needed to, to make this happen. Um, I, I won't get into my background, but I can tell you that the, from the, the, when the power of the lithium ion battery was first realized, I watched our largest, most intelligent geopolitical rival start becoming interested in mining and processing of raw materials needed to make those batteries. I watched as American companies and the U.S. government completely disappeared from the critical raw materials arena, content to receive last mile, just in time deliveries of the finished goods that were mined, processed, and upgraded everywhere but America. In countries that care a lot less about the environment than we do, in countries that care a lot less about the health and safety of employees than we do, and in countries that you all know turn a blind eye to child labor and worse. And yet, here we are, everyone using a laptop, everyone using an iPhone, many of us driving electric cars, um, all of which contain hard to trace lithium ion battery metals that make those machines worse. And a lot of the technology for, this ba for these batteries, which are changing the world, is, is invented by America. American companies invented this technology, and yet we don't mine or process any of the materials here. It, it is really a, a sad state of affairs. I, I'm, hopefully, I'll be able to get into you know, the way uh, our big rival has gotten into this. I spent a bunch of time in Africa watching them take over the natural resources there. But I would like to address the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is China. My former boss uh, a year ago told the, the, for, the Financial Times, he said, if tomorrow China wanted to sell us cars instead of batteries, they could do it. So let that sink in. If tomorrow Chinese wanted to sell us just the batteries and the battery products, we would be buying Xpeng, NIO, BYD cars, Ford, GM, Tesla, all of these great American 
electric vehicle companies would not be able to get the, the raw material supplies. So this is a conversation about national security as well as the environment. Um, I see I, I could go on forever, but uh, I, I hope most of you will read my comments. I have a lot to say in here. We can do it in America. We are doing it. U.S. Strategic Metals is mining in a green way, in a clean way. We are also processing low carbon, low emission, American ingenuity, American technology, hydro metallurgical processing. We're not using pyrometallurgical processing. Our mine is green and clean. We pay high wages. And I, I would just like to say that our, um, you know, the point is we can do this mining and this processing here in America. We can do it the right way, but we need help. We, we need help from the government. We need help from you all to make sure that it's, it's, uh, we have an ability to do it. Um, the time to act, the best time was yesterday. The, the second best time to act is today. And uh, I'd just like to thank you for your time. And hopefully, we can dive into some of the issues uh, that we face in, in the question and answer. I yield back my time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hallman. The chair now recognizes Chairman Franklin for five minutes. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, before I go any further, thanks for the water. It's appreciated. So, hey, and my Iwa. So, she's Chima. I am the Reno County Franklin. I'm the chairman of the Kashaya Pomo tribe. I'm also uh, proudly Hawaiian as well. Uh, and thank you for this opportunity to sit in front of all of you today and talk. And uh, also uh, to my son back home for being patient on his 15th birthday, and his dad is here spending time with all of you. So thank you for that. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about tribes. And you see my testimony has been submitted. I'm not going to go through the whole thing because uh, you, know, you all um, have it in front of you, and you can, and I expect to answer some questions based off of my testimony as well. But you know, really just want to talk about uh, the role that uh, the 1872 mining law um, plays in Indian country. Um, just, you know, I, I think it's important for you all to just to understand uh, the impacts of mining and that it has on tribes. Um, well, I'll start before getting into the impacts. I want to say that tribes not, are not necessarily opposed to mining. And pi tribes fully understand that you know, um, we have minerals that are part of the country and the development of the country um, that keep us going. They keep the lights on. They keep the cars running. And in some cases, when the lights are off, they keep the batteries uh, and, and those lights on, you know, the temporary ones. So we, we recognize the importance. Um, but, I, but I also want to say that when this law was created in 1872, I mean, these tribal rights were just like a thing of that, not even a consideration. You know, and they weren't worried about what are we doing on Indian lands and how are tribal people being impacted by this mining. You know, folks could just come out, um, apply for the mine uh, or, or the, the permit uh, for mining and, and then go out and do it. And that has left, you know, in, in a BLM estimate of 500,000 um, abandoned mines on or near Indian country in the United States. And so in, in my statement of, of saying that tribes are not opposed to mining, what we are opposed to is unregulated mining. And that 1872 act, um, yes, it's a regulation, but it doesn't regulate how mining impacts tribes. And, and I'm here today to talk to you all about that. I'm here to, to ask you to, um, in your consideration of um, you know, possible reforms to the mining laws, um, possible additions, um, that as we look at a few things, as we look at the impacts to tribes, um, as we, there's going to be a lot of discussion, as I imagine, uh, and as it was in the last panel as well, on, on timing and the permitting process. And, you know, I, I want to point out to you all that um, tribes, we have tribal historic preservation officers. I am one of them. Uh, we implement Section 106 on tribal lands and do the consultations along with federal agencies and tribal governments. And uh, one of the things that um, slows down the permitting process on Indian lands, especially for mining, is the, the lack of resources to tribal historic preservation officers. So as we um, look at uh, how we find solutions to, um, to doing mining, and as you all consider it, I'm looking to this side, it's kind of empty, but I'm still going to look over there. Um, as you all consider actions that you'll be asked and decisions that you'll be asked in the future to make, um, just my request to you, as not just as a chairman, not just as a father, um, but um, as, as a citizen of the United States um, and as, uh, as an Indian person who has a vested interest in making sure that my children inherit an environment, um, both botanical environment, but also very important uh, 
a historical, a sacred site environment that I enjoy and that all of our relatives have been able to enjoy, that you consider those things as you look at uh, improvements to process, as you look at potential impacts to tribes, and, um, and as we move forward with, uh, with hopeful reforms to a mining law from 1872, like I said, that really did not look at impacts to tribes or tribal nations. Um, I'd like to, to point out to you also that um, when we have a, a couple of trees, you, know, you can get the seeds from trees and, and plant them in another place. And, uh, and I know that because uh, Class A faller and as a former firefighter, um, you know, I cut down a lot of trees and, uh, and was asked a lot of time to, to assist with gathering the pine cones so that we could take that same stock and put it in another place and grow a forest somewhere else. I want to point out that cultural resources are non-renewable. Can't do that. When you destroy a sacred site, it's gone. It can't be brought back out. It can't be healed and fixed in the way that our forests can or our, uh, our you know, the, the environment around us. Um, so uh, happy to answer questions. Fully expect to have some pretty cool zingy responses that I think we'll all enjoy. Uh, but more important, thank you for the time. Chairman Franklin, thank you for your testimony and happy birthday to your son. The chair now recognizes Mr. Adams for five minutes. Chairman Westerman, uh, Ranking Member Grijalva, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Matthew Adams. I'm Vice President and Senior Tax Counsel for Navajo Transitional Energy Company, uh, also known as NTEC. Navajo Transitional Energy Company was formed in 2013 as part of a groundbreaking initiative by the Navajo Nation to assert and assume full sovereignty over its vast mineral and energy assets. NTEC was established under Navajo law and is, 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 and is an autonomous limited liability company whose sole shareholder is the Navajo Nation. NTEC's initial objective was to take control of the Navajo mine, which is located on the nation just outside of Farmington, New Mexico. In 2019, NTEC acquired all of the assets, substantially all of the assets of Cloud Peak Energy and thereby became the third largest coal producer in the United States. Our coal portfolio includes the Navajo mine, uh, which is the mine mouth that feeds the Four Corners power plant uh, on the nation. Uh, we also have the Antelope and Cordero mines, which are in Wyoming, and the Spring Creek complex in Montana. In 2022, uh, we produced 52 million tons of coal, 49 of which stayed domestic, and just over three that went international to the Asian Pacific. In addition to owning and operating coal mines, NTEC owns and operates uh, helium wells on the Navajo Nation. We have an ownership percentage in the Four Corners Power Plant. We have an ownership interest in the Round Top Rare Earths Deposit in Texas. We just announced a partnership with Arizona Lithium for the development of the Big Sandy Lithium Project in Arizona. We continue to work closely with the owners of Four Corners Power Plant to develop a large-scale merchant power solar facilities on reclaimed mine land on the nation. We truly represent and strive for an all of the above answer and answers for our energy problems and our energy needs. If there is new technology that's gonna be developed and we believe it can provide energy for the nation to help the United States or beyond, we're gonna be interested and we're gonna be there. In addition to what we do, we're very proud of how we do it. Our steadfast focus on safety gets our people home safe. Our stewardship for the land, we lead by example. Last year, the Navajo mine was the first mine in the United States to earn both the National Mining Association Sentinel of Safety, one of the highest safety awards in the United States, and the U.S. Department of Interior's National Reclamation Award of the same year. We are also an essential contributor to the Navajo Nation. Through royalties, taxes, and payments, NTEC provides 30% of the Navajo Nation's general fund, 30% on an annual basis. Further, the Four Corners Power Plant provides another 9%. So 39% is coming from our mine mouth operation on the mine. That plant is currently scheduled to close in 2031. I want to hit some key points that I want to make sure that we get out and that we can talk about today. Coal continues to be an essential resource for the United States. This is true from an energy reliability perspective as well as from a federal revenue perspective. In fact, as I started speaking today, PGM, right now 18% of their electricity is coming from coal. In the middle third of the United States, MISO 30% and SPP 33%. So today on a nice day, a moderate day, uh, with good wind, there's some sun, 
Cole is still doing a third of the work out there. We believe that above all should be above all. Coal needs to stay in the mix. Coal needs to be that base load. Last year, we provided 21% of the base load in the United States. We need innovation, not elimination. We need to shift the focus away from what fuels the plant to how we utilize technology and innovation to ensure that the emissions are where we want them to be. The United States coal fleet has invested approximately $127 billion in emission controls through 2022. In 21, the United States coal fleet emitted 909 million tons of CO2, which was 18%. It was only 18% of the 4.9 billion from energy-related CO2. Global greenhouse gas emissions are estimated to be in the magnitude of 49.8 billion tons in 2020. The United States coal fleet was less than 1.5%. We need to develop a deliberate strategy for a conversion from fossil fuels that does not put lives at risk, does not hinder the economy, and is thoughtful and practical. A coal plant should not be retired before there's comparable replacement energy online. Technology has not advanced to the point where we can do that yet. The reliability of the grid is at stake, and recent grid emergencies from storms have shown that. There are significant issues with the current permitting processes. The United States should look for ways to maximize our coal exports. The revenue from the royalties, as well as replacing coal that is mined in unethical, unenvironmentally friendly ways, we can do that. Finally, uh, I'd like to hit later on on the amount of coal that's burning in the United States is absolutely immaterial to what is being burned in China and the rest of the world. The United States will burn a half a, a, half a billion tons this year, 500 million. The world will burn over 8 billion, half of that being from China. With my time ended, I will conclude my comments. Thank you for your testimony. The chair now recognizes Mr. Summers for five minutes. Good afternoon. I'd like to. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Westerman and Ranking Member Gahalva and the rest of the committee for the opportunity to appear today. And thanks also to Congressman Curtis for being Utah's voice on this committee. I'm Brian Summers, president of the Utah Mining Association, which was founded in 1915 and represents Utah's hard rock, coal, and industrial mineral mine operators and related support industries. UMA also worked closely with the, Utah, with the National Mining Association and other state and regional industry groups. UMA's mission is to advocate on behalf of Utah's mining industry, its workers, and the communities they support. Mining is a critical industry in Utah, contributing $7.7 billion to the state's GDP, supporting nearly 57,000 direct and indirect jobs, and powering Utah's broader economy by producing the coal, which provides 62% of Utah's low-priced low electricity. Mining jobs in Utah are family and community-sustaining jobs, with mining salaries averaging over $83,000 annually, which is 37.5% higher than the average Utah wage. It's important to recognize mining is something most people never experience firsthand, and yet they benefit from the project products made possible by mining every single day. From smartphones to medical devices, consumer electronics, to new energy technologies and national defense systems, our modern economy and quality of life are supported by mined minerals. Demand for minerals is expected to increase radically in coming years, yet domestically produced minerals currently meet less than half of the needs of U.S. manufacturers, creating an untenable strategic vulnerability for our economic and national security. To put this demand in the context of the energy goals of the Biden administration, a 2021 International Energy Agency report stated that, quote, to hit net zero globally by 2050 would require six times more mineral inputs than today, close quote. A 2022 report on copper demand from S&P Global also stated, quote, substitution and recycling will not be enough to meet the demands of electric vehicles, power infrastructure, and renewable generation. Unless massive new supply comes online in a timely way, the goal of net zero emissions by 2050 will be short-circuited and remain out of reach, close quote. Our nation's lack of a clearly defined minerals policy is undermining our ability to supply our own mineral needs and support future economic growth. The U.S. mine permitting system is duplicative, inefficient, and unpredictable, leading to an average federal permitting time frame of seven to 10 years. Compounded by the inevitable litigation from environmental groups, the U.S. permitting process is one of the longest in the world. Countries like Canada and Australia, which have stringent environmental safeguards like the U.S., can get mines through permitting in two to three years. In Utah, mines on state and private lands can be permitted in a time frame similar to those of Canada and Australia. 
However, two-thirds of Utah's land, land which contains many of our state's substantial mineral resources, is controlled by the federal government. The current federal permitting regime obstructs domestic mining and blunts our ability to compete globally. Lengthy delays deter investment and encourage dependence on countries like China, Russia, and the Congo, which have abysmal environmental, labor, human rights, and governance records. According to the 2023 USGS Minerals Com Mineral Commodity Summaries, the U.S. is more than 50% dependent on foreign imports for a staggering 51 import, important mineral commodities, including 15 commodities for which we are 100% import, re import reliant. China was the largest single source of foreign mineral imports in 2022. This import reliance is a threat to our nation and it is unnecessary. Of those 51 mineral commodities for which the U.S. is more than 50% import reliant, Utah has current production, historical production, or established resources for 20 of them. Fully developing our mineral potential in Utah, just one state, could significantly diminish our country's need for foreign imports. Imagine if we could responsibly develop all of our nation's vast mineral estate, guided by our world-class environmental and safety standards, and employing a highly skilled and highly paid workforce. To encourage investment in America's mineral resources, both in mineral production and in processing, the federal government must fix its broken permitting processes, set clear timeframes, establish a lead agency to promote certainty and accountability, and enact policies that ensure access to mineral deposits. I applaud Chairman Westerman for introducing the Securing America's Mineral Supply Chains Act and Congressman Stauber for reintroducing his Permitting for Mining Needs Act. These bills will enable our nation to responsibly develop our mineral resources, reshore supply chains, support domestic manufacturing, and secure our economic and national security. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Summers, and thank you again to all the witnesses. We're now going to go to member questions. We're going to start uh, with Mr. Carl from Alabama. I recognize you for five minutes. Minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Summers, uh, the Alabama Graphite Belt, which is located in Coosa County, Alabama, has some of the world's best reserves of a critical energy material, but a lack of commitment to these resources has led to the suspension of the development over the last several decades. Simple question. How does the United States government plan to encourage the private sector to redevelop graphite resources in order to maintain America's ability to access critical materials as and when needed, rather than relying on China or other unreliable fuel uh, foreign suppliers. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, I, I think that you know we don't have any graphite resources in Utah. I wish we did, but we have a lot of other critical minerals that have also either not been developed or they've had to stop development. And I think that uh, for the federal government to focus again on, on permitting issues that you know add a lot of delays to to the process, and also to encourage. Uh, and incentivize domestic manufacturing and processing. You know, in many cases, the reason that we're, we don't have these minerals produced in the U.S. is because, frankly, they're produced more cheaply elsewhere. And a lot of that is a function of, as I, I mentioned in my testimony, because you've got countries that don't have the same kind of environmental and la labor safeguards. And in some cases, there's flat-out market, market manipulation where they will sell uh, critical minerals into the market, you know, into the commodities markets for, for less than what they cost to produce. Right. And so I think until we find find ways to incentivize production of some of these mineral resources and in some cases even require them if that's, you know, if there's a, a national defense system or something else that calls for some of these resources, it's going to be very difficult for us to continue to compete on a global scale. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, I ask uh, unanimous consent to submit a letter from uh, Warner Met Cole for the records. Without I can objection. get that entered. So ordered. Uh, Mr. Adams. Uh, my district, which has the Port of Mobile, we're very proud of our coal ex exporting there. In fiscal year 2022, the port exported about 10 million metric tons of met coal. For those of y'all that don't know what met coal is, it's coal that's primarily targeted for uh, the metal industry, melting metals. We're in a unique situation uh, in Alabama in that we mine it in central Alabama. Uh, which supply the jobs and, and obviously everything that spins off the, in Jasper and, and up in, in central Alabama. We bring it down the river system that we've been so blessed with uh, into the Port of Mobile. And Port of Mobile creates many, many jobs. 
which we take and we load it on vessels. Most of these vessels are going to Brazil. Uh, they go to Brazil where they're used in the furnaces there. They're heated into metal. The metal comes back to the port of Mobile. It's unloaded in Port of Mobile. We take it up to our steel mills, which are right up the river system. It is stamped out, and it winds up in one of your automobiles that you're probably driving today, whether it be a Mercedes. Uh, we, we, have, we have about seven different manufacturers in Alabama, and it's all done because of Met Coal. That's where it all starts. That's what I want us to focus on here real quick. Can you discuss the economic benefits if you are able, because you, you have a similar situation, obviously, on the Navajo Nation, which uh, I'm, I'm very sensitive to anything dealing, dealing with, with, with our, our ancestries there. Uh, can you discuss the economic benefits if, it, if, if we were able to export our coal to more locations throughout the United States? Would it be a similar story? And what barriers are in place to increase or uh, increase you to export that? Congressman, thank you for your question. Uh, we actually export thermal coal as well, uh, but we have huge roadblocks in being able to do that. Uh, the Port of Mobile is a world-class port. Uh, I wish we had 15 of them around the United States. Uh, the jobs that Mobile has, the economy that is built off of that shipping, everyone should be envious of that. And that opportunity is there for many other states, for many other cities who do not take it we could easily place 40 million plus tons a year into the Asian market. They love American coal. It is consistent, it is high quality. Uh, we would get most, of, most in the West, most of ours on federal land. So the federal government would get 12 and a half percent of that revenue. Um, there was a, but we've had every coal port on the West Coast shut down. Uh, Governor Inslee in Washington or the, or the Corps of Engineers, Army Corps of Engineers, have shut down every single project to export coal out of the West. Uh, so that's, that puts a lot more pressure onto the limited coal ports that there are. The East is lucky with the Met coal. Uh, we don't have Met in the West. We're all thermal, uh, with few exceptions. Uh, but we need more ports. We need to participate. We need to replace Russian coal uh, in the international market, which is absolutely a player. Uh, we need U.S. coal in that revenue. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Curtis for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, witnesses. This is a great hearing. As I listened to your testimonies, it uh, caused a lot of reflection in my mind. Uh, gentlemen, I represent, as, as Brian knows, a, a district in Utah that uh, has a county uh, by the name of Carbon County. I'd love to ask my colleagues here, what do you suppose they do in Carbon County? <laughs> and uh, what I've seen over the five years that I've represented them is what I call the demonization. And unfortunately, not just the demonization of coal, but the demonization of people. And what's unfortunate about that is these are the very people who have sacrificed their health, have sacrificed their safety for generations and generations so the rest of us can go over to a wall switch and flip on the switch and have the lights come on and keep the temperature at 70 degrees. And uh, I, I wish more often people felt a little more connection with where this uh, power source came from and appreciation for these very, very good uh, men and women. And uh, Mr. Franklin, uh, much of this is uh, the Navajo Nation. I take in about a third of the Navajo Nation. Uh, there's about five uh, tribes that call uh, had, that have a connection, uh, even though they don't all live in my district. And I've watched things like the Hopi Nation lose 80% of their revenue when they shut down the coal fire power plant there by Antelope Island. And uh, sometimes we talk about environmental justice, and I wonder where is the the justice to these communities uh, dealing uh, dealing with these issues? And I, I think uh, frequently. Uh, because it's unseen, um, that it's not dealt with. And uh, Mr. Franklin, I also express a commitment to you to better understand some of the things that you've told us in your testimony and how it impacts uh, those people. I know there's a, a lot of uranium mines that have not been resolved um, in not just in the Navajo area, but throughout my district. I think it's important that we, as we go forward, we also look back and, and make sure we're being good stewards uh, there as well. Uh, imagine the hypocrisy in Carbon County when they see that there's actually not enough coal coming out of their coal mines for the coal-fired power plant there because it's going overseas to Europe. 
at a, at a much higher price and being your, burned by our European counterparts who, who brag and shout from the housetops how clean they are. And, and yet uh, they're, they're paying sometimes up, upwards of 400 percent more for that coal than the contracts in those local coal uh, plants are. And, and it's viewed as nothing but hypocrisy, right, by these good, good men and women. And uh, Mr. Summers, thank you uh, for being here. You mentioned in your testimony this problem that we have, that a th a, a two thirds of our state is owned by the federal government. That's exasperated in much of my district. Now, wrap your arms around this. Seven of the counties I represent are 90% federally owned. So imagine trying to uh, eke out a living, an economy, um, anything when 90% of the land doesn't pay property tax, where there's an attack to keep uh, all mining uh, off of these federal lands. And Brian, um, somehow the state is able to regulate these and, and meet um, uh, the high standards uh, where the federal government isn't. What lessons would you like the federal government to learn from Utah's permitting program that, that we might be able to implement federally? Thank you very much, Congressman. I, I think that, again, in, in Utah, if a, a, a mining operation is primarily on state or private lands and doesn't have a significant federal overlap, again, we can get them through a um, uh, permitting process in, in two to three years versus, you know, seven to ten years on the, on the federal side. And I think a lot of that is just the, the fact that there, there are clear um, delineations of authority and, and responsibility to our state agencies. So, you know, you don't have this, this massive overlap where you never quite know exactly where, where your permit is in the process and which agency you need to go and talk to. And I think even just that one step of having a, a centralized, you know, uh, agency of uh, a primary lead agency for permitting on the federal side would be a great first step to take. Are you aware of any shortcuts or environmental damages that occur because our process is two or three times quicker? No. Could, could anybody here point to anything uh, that puts the land in jeopardy um, because our processes are two or three times quicker? Uh, no, and I, and I think that, that part of the advantage, frankly, of having the state, you know, have primacy in some of these permitting processes is the fact that if something does go wrong, if there is a local concern, you actually know who to go and talk to. You know, you can talk to the head of DEQ, the head of Dogum, you know, our, our Division of Oil, Gas, and Mining. You can talk to the, the member of the legislature that represents those communities, and there's much more political accountability. I wish I had more time. Uh, thank you, witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes Ms. Ledger Fernandez from the state of New Mexico for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chair uh, Westerman, and thank you, uh, Ranking Member, uh, for bringing this hearing together, and what a wonderful panel. I have read uh, your written testimonies and know a lot <laughs> about some of the issues around uh, here. You know, I want to begin by recognizing uh, the really hard work of the people, men and women, um, who work in the mining industry, um, who have brought, uh, who have powered powered our nation up to this point. Like we need to recognize how essential that was and is. And Mr. Adams, you know, I think that that is, uh, you're showing that right on the Navajo Nation as well. Uh, and, and I think that there's an interesting uh, difference about what's happening on the Navajo Nation when it is itself controlling its destiny and what it wants to do with its minerals. Uh, th that is, in essence, what you, uh, what you are working on on behalf of the Navajo Nation, correct? That is correct. As, as an autonomous energy company, helping the Navajo uh, by, by managing and producing off of those assets and helping the nation. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's great. And I want to like contrast that with the 1872 mining law, mm -hmm. right? In the 1872 mining law, we are basically, because we haven't updated that, look how, imagine just to say 1872 and the idea that we haven't updated a law from a couple of centuries ago, right? You know, it's like we don't have, it's 18, right? Uh, and, uh, and the fact that some of the companies that are coming in and seeking um, to exploit the resources and to take those precious materials that we do need for so much of what we have. Like a lot of them are actually foreign corporations. And because of the way the 1872 mining law is structured, 
uh, you know, we have subsidiaries of Chinese companies, right, in uh, Arizona, looking for mining. In Pecos, uh, which is um, where my family is from, um, there is a desire to have additional mining. It is also a foreign company um, that is doing that. And that's why I think these resources are precious, but they are American resources. Uh, I wanted to also, you know, touch on the fact that uh, there is a lot of damage still left behind, as you noted, right, from the uranium mines, the Gold uh, King spill mine, my constituents have come to me and we've worked on those issues together. But I wanted to turn uh, a, a bit to TIPOs uh, and the role that they need to play. And thank you so very much, Chairman uh, Franklin, for what you have done uh, in, in pushing these issues. Uh, do you believe that the current 1872 mining law provides adequate environmental protections uh, for mining projects located near tribal lands? Uh, and what would you suggest as updates? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I feel like it's a uh you know, being a uh, major league baseball hitter and having a softball thrown at you. Like, so, so yeah, absolutely, it, it, that it, fails, it fails tribes, the 1872 law does. And, uh, and, and a good example of it is, um, you know, our, our brothers and sisters in Tono Autumn, and I want to apologize first that I'm going to mention uh, human remains uh, and that tribe specifically, um, and, and, and mean this in no disrespect whatsoever, but I think it can't be ignored um, you know, the Animax mining company that had um, gone into the Santa Rita Mountains uh, and, and mined and uh, in the process uh, damaged severely a large village site, um, left uh, human remains on the surface, had mined right through their cemetery uh, and it destroyed artifacts and sacred sites. And that's kind of what I was talking about earlier. This is the kind of thing that we need to avoid but that happens because there are, there's nothing to protect inside of that law. And that's, by the way, that is not even an American company. Um, and, and when they went bankrupt, they left it all on the surface. And now there's another company that is uh, from Canada that's trying to come in and, and assume that mine again. And so, you know, it's just examples and ways that we need to be better, I think, protect not just Tono Autumn's history or American Indian's history, but really is the history of the, com of the entire country as well. And, and this sort of abandonment when, uh, of mines happens way too often. That is indeed the case where taxpayers then end up holding the bag for remediation, right, and, and the need for the cleanup. Uh, and I, you know, I, I uh, really want to look forward to working with the chairman uh, and my colleagues so that we could reauthorize uh, the Historic Preservation Fund. Uh, I carried a bill on that because all the work that we need to do, it can be done, right, right? I think that there is an understanding that there is a way of doing this important work, um, but it is how you do it uh, and, uh, and where you do it that is very important. And we need to answer those questions before we start digging up some cemeteries. And, and I offer you know, my um, shared sadness uh, about the fact that there is indeed uh, what happened, as you pointed out. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Stauber, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Summers, thank you for joining us today. I appreciate and share your passion for mining, uh, like in Utah. It provides family sustaining wages along with the pride of supplying our nation with our resources, just like in my district in northern Minnesota. Uh, and I also want to thank you for mentioning my bill, uh, the Permitting for Mining Needs Act. In Section 3, it limits environmental assessments and environmental impact statements to one and two years, respectively. Can you dis discuss how limiting these time frames will expedite the permitting process and also clarify that even with a time limit, we can ensure all environmental safeguards? Thank you, Congressman. As, as has been discussed even with the previous panel, a lot of the, the problems that we run into with federal permitting is the fact that these processes can be dragged out for, for years and years and years, and there's not strict timelines that are uh, established in federal law that uh, would help to, to expedite these processes. And again, if you look at foreign countries like, as I mentioned, Canada, Australia, these are countries that have very similar environmental safeguards that, that we do. And, and the mining industry wants to develop the <clears throat> mineral assets of, of this country in an environmentally sensitive way. That being said, the, you, you can have a rational time frame 
that allows for uh, adequate environmental review without uh, stretching these things out to you know seven to ten to gears and beyond. Well, I, Mr. Summers, I would say that uh, I've heard you and a couple other folks say that, uh, you know, three to five, five to seven years for mining. I'll let you know that uh, in the Duluth complex in northern Minnesota, the biggest copper nickel find in the world, which, uh, which uh, Joe Biden just uh, banned mining in that district. Uh, but there is a company in its 20th year of permitting. And then there's another one within nine years of permitting process. Uh, and it's just unfortunate, especially uh, if we want to uh, 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 hold ourselves to the highest environmental and labor standards we mine in America. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Holloman, thank you for joining us today. Your testimony, like Mr. Summers, discussed how our foreign rivals control the international minerals market. It also briefly discusses the Inflation Reduction Act, which we were told was meant to reduce inflation. But according to your testimony, it allows metals mined in Indonesia, for example, and processed in China to qualify for uh, IRA funding. Is this true? And can you expand on how these IRA funds also boost Chinese manufacturing? Thank you, uh, that, that's a very good question, and um, I, I'm glad you asked it. It's, it, it was a shock to me. I, I just came back from Korea where I was talking to some of the big FTA battery companies and they were discussing the IRA and the domestic content requirements. Now, as far as I know, these domestic content requirements are not uh, settled. It is still being discussed. There's a negotiation. But the Korean battery makers were interested in doing business in America, in building processing in America, in partnering with groups like us. And yet they were conflicted because they were being told by US OEMs that, you know what, you already have processing of Chinese owned Indonesian metal that goes to a 49% Korean owned processing plant in China and that will qualify. All we have to do is send it in a, an intermediate product and then roll it into a battery in America and that's gonna qualify. And this is something that I think needs to be known that that is not right. I've, I've spoken to people right and left that say, no, that's not the intent of the law. What you just described, excuse me, but what you just described is American taxpayer money going overseas to foreign, in some cases, adversarial nations to mine those critical minerals. It will be if we're giving a $7,500 taxpayer rebate for an electric vehicle that has its metals mined and processed by the Chinese. So that absolutely will happen. It hasn't happened yet because we, we don't have that um, implementation, but it's coming soon and we need to get ahead of it. It's, it's something I think it's important for you all to know that that cannot be the domestic content requirement. We need it to be processed and mined in, U, in the USA, we can do a lot of it here, um, or the free trade agreement countries as well, but let's try to get as much as we can, especially nickel and cobalt here. I agree, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Gentleman yields back, and I recognize Ranking Member Grijalva for five minutes. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Summers, uh, Question. The, the part of the discussion, almost the entire discussion, has been about NEPA and uh, and and how it, it slows uh, the ability for uh, for full extraction of gas, oil, mining, etc. Um, another piece of legislation that guides the mining industry is 1872 law. And like was stated about NEPA, that it's time to fine tune it, bring it up to date. Uh, to these times, do you uh, do you feel the same? Do you feel that this committee should uh, explore that as well with the 1872 mining law? Uh, thank you for the the question. I, I I think that any federal statute is is not going to be perfect, and there's opportunities to refine them. But I do think that it's it's necessary to clarify that the mining law of 1872 is a land tenure law. It's it's the 
law that guides how you get the, the legal rights to, to develop mineral opportunities here in the U.S. It's not an environmental protection or conservation law. You know, for that, okay. we've, got, we've got NEPA, we've got uh, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, we've got NAGPRA. I mean, there's a I number of it. different... Yeah. Thank you, sir. It's just the 1970s and the 1870s, that's the uh, difference I was trying to draw to. Uh, Mr. Holloman, do you feel, uh, as part of... Uh, and, and you mentioned in your testimony the uh, having to do business with foreign uh, mining entities, uh, multinational corporations that work in other parts of the world to, that exploit people, uh, horrible labor standards, no concern for environmental uh, environmental protections or clean air, clean water issues. Do you feel those mining, those kind of entities? Uh, should be allowed to do business if they're violating it at that level in other countries, do business on public lands and waters here in the United States? Absolutely not. Uh, and, and any look at going forward in the future, those kinds of bans and restrictions would be appropriate? Let's say Rio Tinto, who has a horrible history in other parts of the world, but has major mining industry here in the United States, which should we, they be banned from doing business on public land? They should be looked at very closely. The, the foreign entities that are not keeping the standards up to American standards elsewhere in the world must be looked at. The Congo, for example, you have Appreciate all that. types of mining. Uh, let me, uh, and, and thank you, Chairman Franklin, for being here with us. Uh, I think one of the misunderstood issues about something is being slowed down uh, in terms of uh, the points that you were making uh, fails to recognize that in many, whether it's Oak Flat, whether it's the Ottoman Santa Rita, whether it is other issues affecting tribes, whether in Nevada and other parts, the issue of sacred sites, cultural and historic resources, why they need to be brought up in the consideration, evaluation, and analysis, and the consultation with the tribes. Yeah, there's, there's Talk about that, that importance and why we why many of the conflicts we see out there between Indian country and a mining entity or another development has to do with that core issue. All right. So, so let me first say that the reason why I think that Navajo's outfit is working so well is they're accountable to their own people. When you bring foreign interests in, they're not accountable to the United States people, unless we hold them accountable. And that's what I would look to all of you to do and, uh, and my colleagues up here. Um, the importance of, of sacred sites and how that connects uh, a Canadian mining company doesn't care what they're doing to indigenous people in the United States. It's, uh, maybe they do, but they sure haven't been showing it, right? Um, once those resources are gone, like I was saying earlier, they're gone. You know, when you, when you disrespect the tribal burials like that by just, you know, coming and mining and leaving the human remains on the surface, not even giving them the dignity of reburial or even inviting the tribe to come along and, and assist. So th those are just things that as a country I think we're better than. Um, as, you know, as a Congress, I know that you're better than, right? And, and you all have the opportunity to stop those kinds of foolishness uh, from happening. And, and I know that it's, it's something that you're, is of interest with you as well. Um, sacred site protection is, is of the uh, utmost protection, uh, importance, excuse me, to American Indian tribes. It's right up there with language, right up there with safety, and right up there with our families. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if Mr. Mr. Adams, the, 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 the Navajo Nation consistently, regardless of the administration, uh, their elected officials have voted consistently resolution and action after action banning uranium mining on the res, on, in, in, in the nation, banning the transport uh, having to do with the legacy. Uh, and as a partner of the Navajo Nation in, 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 in the business relationship, how do you feel about that? I appreciate the question. Um, I can't represent uh, the Navajo Nation or, or the thoughts of the government. I, I know that there is, is not a, uh, there are a lot of difficult decisions that were made in the past. I know that the policy right now is that They've had issues with uranium and they don't want to deal with it. Uh, what the future holds, uh, what the new president, Bo Nigren, is, is going to do with that, we don't know at this point. Uh, we are not pushing on uranium angles. With that, yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, yields back. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Wyoming, Ms. Hageman, for five minutes. 
Thank you. Mr. Summers and all of you gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Uh, Mr. Summers, thank you uh, for your statements and you highlighted in your testimony the fact that mining is something most people don't experience firsthand, yet they benefit from its results every day. I agree with that fact in that statement and that is particularly true of the folks who live right here in Washington, D.C. Wyoming, however, is a mining state, and from being the home of the world's largest trona deposits to its abundant coal reserves, uranium mining, and countless other minerals, mining is a way of life in our state and a major driver of our economy. When Joe Biden wages war on American mining alongside radical environmental groups, our state suffers and America suffers. My question to you is, how has the messaging of this administration towards, this, towards the mining and coal industry impacted our state's abilities to generate revenue, as well as our ability as a country to lower electricity costs for the consumers? Uh, <clears throat> thank you for that, Congresswoman. I, I think that the, the messaging is, is unhelpful and it's also a little confusing, frankly. I mean, when you talk about some of the, the energy, new energy technologies and the energy transition goals of the Biden administration, but then you're withdrawing huge tracts of federal land from development, as Congressman Stauber talked about, as we've seen in Alaska and elsewhere, and in Utah. You know, and we've had two, we have two very large national monuments that have locked up substantial mineral resources. And in terms of being able to develop, you know, and, and bring the investment that's needed to uh, develop our mineral resources, you know, which are, are very expensive and complicated to develop, if you've got messaging from the federal administration that says, you know, on the surface, yes, we want to do all this stuff, but then as you get into to federal permitting, as you get into land withdrawals and all the other things that have been talked about, it sends a very mis mixed message. And so I do think that it hinders our ability to attract the investment that we need. And I think also on the coal side, you know, we're a very coal heavy state as well. As I mentioned, 62% of our electricity comes from coal. And, you know, to have those coal communities constantly hearing that, you know, we're, we're shutting down your plants, we're shutting down your mines, uh, makes it a difficult to also get these uh, younger generations of workers to want to come in and, and work in these very high paying and highly skilled jobs. Thank you. Over 40% of the coal that is produced in this country comes from my state, from the state of Wyoming. So we play an essential role in keeping electricity costs low for Americans. I think it's rather unfortunate that this administration doesn't see the direction the entire world is going with, world, with coal production. Coal is the second largest source for US electricity Germany and Asian nations have seen a large increase in their reliance on coal power. I know and firmly believe that coal is the energy of the future, and as radical environmentalists try to force their countries into an electrified transition, the world is not ready it for in terms of minerals mined and process, lack of infrastructure and more. Coal, however, is there time and time again to keep the lights on. Mr. Summers, again, can you explain why the U.S. continues to rely so heavily on coal and why other nations are seeing an increase in their reliance on coal for power? Absolutely. Um, again, part of this is, you know, you, you use the, the resources that you have available in your state because there's benefits beyond just providing that uh, inexpensive and reliable dispatchable power. It also has benefits in terms of creating jobs, creating royalties uh, and monies for federal or for local economies. And I think that part of the reason that the world is moving in that direction of using more coal is the simple fact that, you know, we have an energy crunch generally. You've seen natural gas prices that have risen substantially. You've seen disruptions in supply. Uh, the, the renewables have not uh, produced in the manner that they've been, that we were promised that they would produce. And so you need that that reliable, dispatchable, inexpensive power, and people will, will get it. I mean, we're shipping coal to Europe. You know, we're shipping coal to other parts of the world that we haven't shipped to for decades, frankly, because there's so much demand out there because of the general shortage of energy that we have. And coal's an important part of making sure that people don't freeze to death, frankly. Coal is affordable, it's accessible, it's clean, and it's the energy of the future. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. 
As I mentioned, certain countries have had to rely more on their energy and power to make up for shortages that are a product of their attempt to force an electrified transition before the world is ready. Our nation pre prepared for the electrified future they envision and whether these Biden administration policies run the same risks here in the United States. Yes, I mean, as, as has been mentioned, there's massive mineral demand that's required for new energy technologies and for energy transition. And frankly, the federal policies around developing those minerals are, are not adequate to, to make sure that we meet that demand. You know, we, we do produce a lot of coal, but we also are a major copper producer. We're one of only two states that produces lithium. We produce magnesium, and we produce a lot of things that you need for all of these energy technologies. But, you know, the, the federal policies are not, again, encouraging investment, and in some cases are discouraging the development of these, these resources in, a, in an adequate way. Well, and thank you, and thank you, gentlemen, for making our lives better. I yield back. Ladies, time's expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Tiffany, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And some of those that you just rattled off, Mr. Summers, we have uh, right in the great state of Wisconsin, and we're not being allowed to mine them with some of the toughest environmental regulations you'll find anywhere in the world. Uh, Mr. Franklin, good to have you here today. Um, in your statement here, um, uh, the government can create fairness in this process by mandating consultation are there states that are not consulting with tribes? Yeah, yeah, and so as a part of the Mining Act, you see that happen. Um, and I won't say states that aren't consulting, because states, you know, our states do a good job of, of reaching out to tribes and discussing, but um, for the purposes of this Mining Act, absolutely. Um, but for the purposes of states, they do. Um, so if you could share with me a list of the uh, states that don't consult um, with the tribes, because I think about the state of Wisconsin. I mean, we specifically have a consultation process, and I'd be very surprised mm -hmm. that there's a state that isn't. But if there is, I'd sure like to see that list, if you don't mind. Yeah, no problem. And, and I have uh, some staff behind me from the National Association of TIPOs that can work and, um, and probably get you uh, a list of projects where the, the consultation that was done was extremely poor. Um, but I will compliment you on your state. Um, you all have done a fine job. Uh, and Menominee certainly is a tribe that has, uh, has discussed consultation with your state and, uh, and it being inclusive. Sure. Um, you also state in here, we do not ask for disproportionate power. Um, recognize the importance of, uh, and the importance of mining. Um, once again, who is out there that's um, um, not giving the information that the tribes want because um, we consistently have that? Oh, you brought it for the answer. Yeah. So I have actually have an, in, in my written statement, I have a really good example of that with Tono Autumn um, Nation. And I just discussed it a little bit ago. Um, you know, and, and in this case, these were two foreign mining companies that came in and destroyed their village. Um, but that, you know, that, that plays out multiple times um, across federal lands uh, when, when being granted the right to come in and, and mine under this 1872 Mining Act um, with foreign interests. Um, there's a, a, another one that's got a permit in the exact same space for Tono Autumn where the village was destroyed. There's another foreign mining company that is, is proposing and asking for a permit. And I think it might have been granted that was submitted in 2019. I would just share, Mr. Chairman, um, part of the reason that we hear that we don't have any, that we have all these foreign owned mining companies is because of the uncertainty of the permitting process. What goes on with NEPA, why would you as a, an American take your capital and invest in a project here in the United States of America? Um, isn't that correct, Mr. Adams, that um, um, there's a, a great discouraging of having um, domestic manufacturing? Yeah, and on the coal side, um, because our permitting, we, we, there, there's an amazing amount of coal in the U.S., okay? But from, from what's permitted, we're in danger. Uh, we're looking at 15 to 20 years and the financial investment that has to take place. If, if I go win an LBA and I have to come up with a half a billion dollars to buy that coal, I have to pay that in the first five years after getting it. It's going to be at least another seven years before I get a penny of revenue off of that. By the way, if we could go back to the State of the Union last night, President Biden saying, look at these companies that are having all these stock buybacks and things like that. 
why would they invest in America, uh, in American energy, when they may have a stranded asset in the very near future with trying to shut things down? I mean, I have a natural gas fired plant uh, up in Superior, Wisconsin, that is almost done with the process of being able to build now, and it would augment the um, intermittent sources of power that are being built around the Midwest. The EPA, the Biden EPA, just came in in the last six months and said, you got to go through um, a more detailed permitting process. Delay is death. And so they're really discouraging people from being able to invest. And so why would they invest when you see that? Um, Mr. Holloman, would you um, expound a little bit more? You heard from Representative Stauber about these foreign sources and um, how there are going to be foreign countries that are going to benefit from what is supposed to be bought by an America. Could you expound on that a little bit more? Sure. You, you know, China took a bet a long time ago, 15 or so years ago, that they, they don't have a bunch of mines either. And what they did was they built processing. They built a lot of processing all across the, you know, future technological mining uh, industry, copper, cobalt, lithium, nickel. They built the processing there to make the products such as sulfates or precursor cathode active material or cathode active material. And that is now where you have to sell your metal if you're a big producer. There are partners of ours that are big companies, a Glencore, for example, that is trying to do the mining correctly and they don't have options to sell their cobalt, even if they have one of the few mines in the Congo that mines properly and is watched and they only use proper Western practices, but they have to send it to China because China has the only processing. We don't have any processing here. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Montana who uh, got a chance to visit in his district last year, the only platinum and palladium mine in the United States. Mr. Rosendale, you're recognized for five Thank you very minutes. much, Mr. Chair. And as, as we've spoke, that's uh, not the only place that palladium and platinum is located in the United States. It's just the only place that it's permitted. That's part of the problems that we were running into. Uh, Mr. Summers, a moment again, you referenced the national monuments and the amount of land that has been pulled out of uh, potential production and productivity as, uh, because they have been designated as national monuments. So my question is that these extremely large uh, tracks that have been pulled out, uh, it, it's causing a lot of problem to have access to uh, the, the valuable resources that are located beneath them. In your opinion, what do you feel was the original intent? Because that's what we rely upon here. The original intent of the size and the purpose of the designation of a national monument was. And do you think that a clarification of the language uh, would be very beneficial? Uh Absolutely. The, the Antiquities Act, I think, has been abused in recent decades to lock up mineral resources and, and for other purposes for which it wasn't intended. Um, if you look at uh, one of the original national monuments, which is the Natural Bridges National Monument in Utah, in southern Utah, that has some of the most beautiful natural bridges that you'll find anywhere in the world. That was a, a monument that was designated by Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt, and it's 7,000 acres. The Bears Ears Monument that we've been fighting over for the last 10 or so years was originally 1.3 million acres. And so you're locking up a lot of land, and, and some of that land absolutely should be protected, but a lot of it it's not necessary to have that level of protection on. Uh, the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument is 1.9 million acre national monument, one of the, the largest that we have, and that locked up a, a large number, a large amount of our, our coal reserves in the state. Some of the best coal that you'll find anywhere was locked up because of that national monument. So I think that the, we need to get back to the original intent, which is to find those, those landscapes and those cultural resources that need legitimate protection and, and protect those with, you know, national monument or whatever other designation is, is appropriate. 
But also part of that is that when you have those national monument designations, there's not resources that come with that. So there's not an appropriation from Congress that says we're going to give you the resources that you need to appropriately manage this land. And so you'll have, you know, 1.3 million acres of, of land that's designated and you've got a couple of BLM law enforcement that are supposed to patrol that whole area. And in some cases, we're finding actually more degradation to the cultural resources than we had before. Sure. And again, do you feel that we could have some clarification to the Antiquities Act to, to, to try and, and straighten some of that out? Absolutely. I would love to hear some recommendations from you on some of that language that we could try to incorporate. Thank Mr. You. Holloman, we appreciate you coming here uh, before this committee, shed some light on just how difficult the development of critical and strategic minerals are in the United States. Despite us being one of the leading consumers and developers of electrification, you highlight just how reliant we are on our foreign adversaries for these technologies, specifically mentioning that 90% of the world's cobalt, nickel, and rare earth minerals are being processed in China, a country that we are constantly in competition with, as clearly evidenced by the spy balloon which traveled over our country, specifically Montana, looking at our ICBMs in an Air Force base all of last week. Um, your company, U.S. Strategic Metals, is an example of how feasible this can be if only the federal government would let us. You had one line of your testimony that I think is rung very, very uh, uh, clear to a lot of people sitting in this room today. The best time to act was yesterday. The second best time to act is today. I seek to act today to defend ourselves against foreign reliance on these minerals. And my question for you is, what, in your opinion, are some of the specific actions that Congress can put into motion to allow for these domestic capabilities to develop, and how we, can we prevent the administration from continuing to block mineral development in the United States? It's a great question. Thank you, Congressman. I, I think the important thing is to be involved in this domestic content negotiation that's going on with the IRA. It, it has been passed. It's about to go into into action and we need to make sure that the content of the batteries for electrification are made in America or free trade agreement countries. This is gonna be a big ask and we're gonna to have to get our GMs, our Fords, our Teslas involved in this. And I think that, you know, the Congress can do a lot in making sure that that happens. There's another thing we have to do is debunk everywhere you see it, the narrative which is coming out that it's too late. I just read an article where they have people on the hill saying Chinese presence in the electric vehicle market is already nearly ubiquitous. Corporate partnerships between Chinese and foreign autom automakers, including those in the US, is standard and that reaching America's climate goals without Chinese technology would be exceedingly difficult. We must stamp out this narrative. We can handle it here in America. We cannot yield to this position that we have to use Chinese technology. It just happened in Virginia. You had CATL, a great Chinese company, but coming in and they wanted to build battery manufacturing with Ford in Virginia using Chinese technology and they wouldn't show us the technology. We can't have that. We can do all of this stuff ourselves. We just need your help. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hallman. Mr. Mr. Chair, I would yield back. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to recognize Mr. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just sat there and let you preach on all day. <laughs> you know, uh, I want to start out. I, want, I just want to echo the reflection comment that uh, Mr. Curtis made earlier. Uh, as I've been sitting here, I've been reflecting as well. And uh, I campaigned on reeling in China and uh, moving away from a dependency on China. But uh, as Mr. Rosendale stated also, China is not our friend. That's evident by the balloon that they sent over us last week just to surveil us. And, and I really believe that the American people now have begun to wake up uh, to China, if nothing else, than about a year and a half ago when they saw their Christmas goods sitting off the coast of California that we couldn't get. So, uh, Mr. Adams, I, I appreciate I knew you had a, a, an opinion and you commented on China as well as Mr. Summers. I've heard you comment on it too. But I wanted to ask a, a question of, of Mr. Holloman because uh, in your testimony, you, uh, you discussed uh, that we have, uh, we have seen China emerge as the unquestioned leader in the minerals market. 
And uh, what factors caused the United States to fall behind during the same period that China became dominant? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, we did not have a strategic will. Our country was always getting things for you know, the cheapest and the quickest and just in time. China started thinking about this many, many years ago. I was in Africa in the early 2000s going around to different countries, business meetings and, and um, government tenders. And the Chinese were always, uh, were all there. They were out tendering for Chinese, uh, for African mining concessions. They were in Latin America getting mining concessions. They were in Indonesia getting mining concessions. This is China incorporated the will of a country to go out and secure the future of raw materials. We were absent. Uh, America, you know, just to be blunt, is we were very lazy. And, and that is something that has to change. And I, I think the only way it changes is when we realize that we cannot control our own destiny. Well, having said that, what, what do you see as, uh, I don't know, national security implications of U.S. lagging behind China like that? For the military, I don't know what our DOD stockpile for nickel and cobalt and copper and lithium is, but I know it's needed in all of our high-tech equipment. Our airplanes, jet engines need alloys from cobalt and nickel. We don't have any of it. We import 100% of, of these metals. Our vulnerability is complete. We are completely vulnerable because of the lack of a stockpile and, and the lack of an ability to produce it here and mine it here. And oh, by the way, we have cobalt here. We have nickel here. In Idaho, in Missouri, where we are, we've got copper. We're also making lithium from recycling. So we can do it all here, and we can also import other metals and process it here. We can import from a company like Glencore. It's ready to sell to an American processing company if we create the processing. I always say, why don't we export batteries? Why don't we export PCAM and sulfate? We're, we can do it, but there are no options for the world's miners, and we're not mining ourselves enough. Man, amen. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what uh, I think this is probably a pretty good softball, though. What can we do to close that gap? Help American companies mine and help them process. And, and this, this, there's a bipartisan kind of uh, feeling around this because whereas climate change is the fear on one side, there's China and national security is the fear on the other side. Let's talk across the aisle if we can because I think there are people in the administration that want to help. That's, that's really my recommendation to the House committees. And, and let's make sure we have this law, this IRA, law which says domestic content, it's got to mean domestic content. No loopholes, no big companies coming in and allowing uh, additional metal from, from foreign entities of concern. It, it's written in the law that you cannot use metal from foreign entities of concern. We got to stick to that. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Summers, real quick, uh, copper, gold, and silver among many mineral commodities not listed as critical by the Department of Interior. How important is it to increase production of these minerals in addition to resources like the lithium, gallium, and cobalt? It's, it's critically important. So, I mean, if you look at the, the mineral demand, a lot of those are for, for minerals that aren't on that critical minerals list, especially copper. You know, we have one of the largest copper mines in the world in Utah. And, you know, without uh, increasing copper production substantially, we're not going to meet any of these energy transition goals or to be able to uh, supply the copper we need for economic development generally. Thank you. Sorry about that. You back, Mr. Chairman. No problem. Uh, great discussion going on here. Um, next, we'd like to turn to Representative LaMalfa. You have five minutes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chimney. Appreciate it. Um, Mr. Adams, I wanted just to get a little background of, sorry, I missed a portion of the hearing here, of um, your company and its uh, ownership there. Is it, uh, is, uh, is it uh, primarily owned by the Navajo Nation? Yes, yeah. Congressman. We are wholly owned wholly by owned. the Navajo Nation. Okay. And I know of uh, the, the Four Corners power plant as well? That is correct. 
uh, it's had some hard times in recent years. What is its current status on operation? Like how, what percentage of its, uh, how hard are you able to run the plant and such? So uh, Four Corners Power Plant is doing very well. Uh, a lot of that power is being bought from states west of that that apparently don't burn coal. Uh, Any so of it <laughs> sold into California, do you think? Absolutely. Oh, uh, California buying that. Huh? We, we own a percentage of the Four Corners Power Plant. Uh, APS is still the controller of that. Uh, the San Juan plant uh, just closed, uh, unfortunately. And uh, we were with some other groups that were very involved in doing a carbon capture project. But PNM... Uh, from pressures from um, from certain groups, strip that plant uh, as quickly as possible so it couldn't be converted to a carbon capture. How long, is that underway? Uh, yeah, that's already taken place. Um, um, okay. What, what's the what was the source of the coal? Source of the coal from that was the San Juan mine. Where was uh, that at again? Uh, it's just off the nation in New Mexico, uh, just outside of Farmington, New Mexico. Okay, thank you. Um, Tell me about the technology in order to operate the plant there. What, is, uh, what, what's, what technology, as far as the cleanliness and such, was, uh, uh, I, was most recently in place? Sure, absolutely. I think, uh, I mean, as I, as I laid out earlier, there's been $126 billion invested by coal companies uh, in, in, in utilities into power plants. Mm -hmm. um, is, if, if you haven't been to a coal plant, if you haven't been to a coal generating electrical plant, you should make that happen. It, it would, I think everyone would be very surprised at what they saw uh, from a cleanliness perspective, from an environmental perspective, from a, how the process works. Uh, I think that that's a very, very important field trip uh, that we would love to work with our partners in, in West Virginia just from a, from a proximity perspective to make that happen for this committee, uh, to understand that process, to understand everything that is taking place uh, from an emissions perspective in the coal plants. Uh, as Asia has continued to build out coal plants, um, they, they're they using the, the newest, latest technologies. And let's, uh, let's talk about um, the output of, um, you know, the, the effluent, the smoke, whatever, uh, between, let's say, a plant made in 1940 and the one today. How much cleaner are we talking about with uh, particulate, with uh, gases, et cetera. I, I don't have those exact numbers. Well, I don't just, get those views, just but, it, but it is. Spitball it a bit. It, it, I mean, it, it's, it, what we're doing now isn't even comparable from a tech. I mean, we're five iterations of technology past uh, where we were. Uh, what people, when people look at pictures of a smokestack at a coal plant, they're like, look at that, look at the smoke, look at that steam. I know, they, they, they play that a lot. A lot of, Absolutely. A lot they of get, steam coming out of things. It's played all the time. But uh, the emissions are, uh, I, I would live on the east side of a coal plant dealing with the wind blowing that over my house all day, every day. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Summers, um, following up on previous conversation, um, and I've heard a lot in the conversation here about how important it is we have a domestic supply that we've uh, ceded so much to China, and China has moved in on other countries and basically has got the market cor cornered on so many critical minerals and rare earths, et cetera. Um, w what's our potential in this country if we had environmental laws that are more realistic about uh, what, we're, what we need to do uh, at the same time as we're trying to mandate everything to be electrified? Yeah. Well, as I mentioned in my testimony, for those, you know, 51 commodities that were, you know, more than 50% reliant, Utah alone has, has production or historical production of 20 of those. You know, on the original 2018 critical minerals list, we host 28 of those 35 critical minerals. So again, just in one state, we have the ability to really uh, lessen our dependence on, on foreign imports. And if you expand that to, to other mining states, to Arizona, to uh, New Mexico, even California, there's a lot of, of opportunity to, to end that reliance. But again, you, you have to have the incentive for investment and you have to have rational environmental laws so that that capital will, will come here. Now, um, what, what does the footprint look like usually for a typical mine? I know we've made massive national monuments and set asides, you know, hundreds of thousands, even million acres. What's, what's the footprint of a mine over its, say, 50-year life? 
How many acres does it need to do the job? It, it depends, to be honest, because, I mean, you know, our, our big copper mine in the state, you know, Rio Tinto Kennecott, is a massive mine, and part of that is because the concentrations of copper and gold and silver palladium, other things good you place. get from that mine, yeah. is very small. But we also have, you know, the only working beryllium mine in, in the U.S., which provides about 70% of our beryllium. You can't have an F-35, you can't have an F-22 without beryllium. That's a, a fairly small operation. How many just, acres is that beryllium mine, you think? I, I don't know exact just, acreage. Just, yes, the square mile, what do you think? I, I mean, I, I would say it's it's under 1,000 acres, the whole operation. Okay, so, so that's I about mean, a, a, a pretty substantial, you know, a fairly fairly compact mine because the concentrations of beryllium are, are, are very about substantial. The, how about the copper mine? How big is the copper mine, you think, in uh, footprint? I, I mean, it, it takes a, a whole mountain range, frankly. So, I mean, it's, uh, you, you can but see how, it much, from, how much scar do you see? How much disturbed area would you see? It, it's very visible. It's very visible. But the, the parts that are actively mined are visible. The parts that, re, that have been reclaimed, you wouldn't even know that they've ever been mined in. And yeah. that's, I think, a difference between what we do in the U.S. versus what happens in some of these foreign countries where, you know, the, the environmental degradation is substantial. Absolutely. I appreciate your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentlewoman from Puerto Rico wished to be recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank recognized you. Recognized for five minutes. Thank you. And thank you, other witnesses, for coming here. Um, Mr. Summers, in your written state testimony, uh, you described the U.S. mine permitting system as duplicative, inefficient, and unpredictable. You also explained that the average federal mining permitting process can take between seven and 10 years. My question will be, can you discuss how these delays put the United States at a competitive disadvantage and contribute to our dependence on foreign uh, adversaries like Communist China and Russia for hard rock minerals? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Um, and, and again, that seven to ten year time frame is an, an average time frame. And so there, there are projects that have been discussed here that are, are far beyond that. Um, you know, Congressman Sauber talked about a one in his district that's, you know, 20 plus years at this point. So I think that when you're talking about, you know, putting us at a disadvantage, if you can go to a country that essentially has, you know, no environmental protections, then, you know, if you're willing to operate there, you can get a mine permitted basically by, by writing a check. If you want to stay with a, a country that has similar environmental protections, again, like Canada, Australia, some European countries, and you can get a mine through permitting in two to three years if you're looking to get that return on your investment, which in most cases for a large mine is going to be hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of capital invested, and you want to get to that return when you actually start making money, if the difference is between two or three years and seven to 10 to 20 years, you know, that obviously puts us at a disadvantage. In some cases, our resources are so good that companies are willing to take those risks and, 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 and uh, sort of take their chances with those permitting timelines, but it definitely puts us at a disadvantage and, again, degrades our ability to provide for our own mineral resources. I, I am extremely concerned about the China control on the global mineral supply chain. And, and for instance, uh, according to a 2022 Brookings report, um, that nation's refined 68% of nickel globally, 40% of copper, 59% of lithium, and 73% of cobalt. And according to our own U.S. Geological Survey 2022 Mineral Commodities Summaries Report, China has the leading supply, it's been the leading supplier for 16 critical minerals, minerals, as well as 25 other minerals our nation depends on. So my question will be, what specific policies um, or actions will you recommend this Congress to pursue to end this dependence? Um, you bring up a critical, critical point, which is, you know, part of it is the extraction side, but part of it is also the processing side. So even for, you know, well-developed uh, commodities like copper, we only have two copper smelters left in the entire U.S. There's one in Salt Lake City, there's one in Arizona. Two for the entire U.S. And again, this is a mineral that we use in all kinds of products. You know, we don't have 
uh, the processing, smelting, refining capabilities for a lot of these critical minerals as you described. And I think that that has to be part of these discussions uh, across the board. And, and for processing facilities, in some cases you run into the same permitting hurdles that you do with an extractive uh, operation because you're still dealing with air quality permits or water quality permits and other things that have to go through a federal permitting process that as we've discussed can be, uh, that, that's very antiquated, that's very unorganized and, and doesn't have the kind of timelines and certainty that you need to make these substantial investments. Again, you know, a, a copper smelter, a, a cobalt refining operation, these are going to be, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars that you're going to invest in these facilities. So I think you have to have more rational permitting. And then again, if there's opportunities to incentivize investment in these type of operations, that's something that the U.S. could do to make sure that, again, we're not, you know, digging up, you know, rare earth minerals, for example, in California, and then we're shipping them off to, uh, to China to be processed. We're not, you know, relying on uh, China for, for cobalt or nickel or whatever the case is. Again, there's very few of these things that we can, uh, on the uranium side, you know, we're talking about building new small modular nuclear reactors in this country, which was a, a great thing to pursue. But in most cases, you have to rely on halo uranium that's coming from Russia because we don't have those enrichment facilities anymore in the U.S. Thank you. And the other back. Young lady yields back, and I recognize myself for questions. And I again want to thank this uh, excellent panel of witnesses for your testimony today and for your answers uh, to the uh, committee's questions. And as I've, I've listened in and I think about the situation that we're in, there are several words that come to mind challenges, opportunities. I see blessings and curses and responsibilities. You know, all of that rolled into one. I wanted to break that down a little bit and look at the challenges that we face. We could have a, a hearing like this on every mineral and element that's mined in our country and every one that we depend on. But let's, let's use copper. Let's just look at copper, which is so critical uh, to electrification. And the statistic came out, and it's, it's, it's almost hard to fathom, but the, the World Bank says that by 2045, we have to mine more copper than we've mined in the past 5,000 years to meet global demands. So think about that. In the next 20, 25 years, we need to mine more copper than mankind has mined in the history of the world to meet the projections. That's a massive challenge. Mr. Summers, you talked about two copper smelters in the United States. China has 50 of them. So we can't get, the Chinese Communist Party isn't quick to share uh, data with us on, on their economy, but we can get data on the U.S. economy. And we know from, from testimony here, just from other hearings we've had, that America is blessed with abundant natural resources. A lot of stuff that, that we can mine, I've done a lot of work and staff done work with USGS and I've actually got a report here that I'm going to submit to the record. It's the 2023 USGS, USGS Mineral Commodity Summary Figure 1. And my question to staff was how big is the mining industry in the United States? What does it look like? And we all hear about uh, value-added processes. Well, if we look at what we dig up and what we recycle here, some of that gets exported, some of it gets used, but what we keep here from mining and recycling, it's a, it's a net of about $120 billion, the value of those raw materials. So you take those and you get processed minerals out of it. Now that value added process from $120 billion, when it goes through um, smelting and the, the next stage, the value of that comes up to $923 billion. So you get almost eight times the value from uh, what you mine and recycle as to what you've processed. But the real number and the mind boggling one is what happens after you get that processed mineral and you start manufacturing things out of it. Now, maybe we've painted the picture that 
that mining is not strong in the United States and that further processing is not strong, but still that $923 billion of processed minerals, and part of that is our minerals that we import, um, adds 3.3 or $3.6 trillion to the U.S. GDP. Now, again, we could break this down and we're trying to get the numbers on every thing that's mined and processed in the United States. We just think back to copper that has such a huge demand on it. We've got two smelters. China, we know, has got at least 50. How much of our GDP are we exporting when we buy those manufactured goods from China that we could be producing right here at home? So that's a huge opportunity. I don't think we really stop and recognize the the economic opportunity that we have here uh, in the U.S. Uh, so we've looked at uh, challenges, opportunities, the blessings we've got. There's, there's curses associated with mining. And uh, we know that there are some terrible human rights violations around the world. These are pictures from uh, the so-called Democratic Republic of Congo. It's child slave labor, forced labor, digging the stuff out of mines to go to Chinese refineries to make stuff to ship here to the United States and around the world. Now, we have cobalt, we have nickel, we have a lot of these deposits here in the United States, and with the, the insatiable appetite for more minerals, the mining is going to happen somewhere. This, regardless of who owns these companies, this will not happen in the United States of America. Under no ownership will American citizens allow this kind of human rights abuses in the United States. So do we want to stand by and watch this continue to happen in other parts of the world because we have a not in my backyard policy uh, here in the US? So these are the things I think we have to come to grips with is to how do we responsibly use the resources that we have here? How do we meet these massive demands and how do we do it uh, with the most environmentally sound practices with the, without human rights violations. Actually, we would be increasing the benefits to humanity by not only providing these materials, but providing phenomenal paying jobs by growing our own economy and that value-added process. Uh, it could be a huge boon for the U.S., but that gets to our responsibility. The responsibility as members of this committee, as members of Congress, as to how we're going to move forward. And it should be bipartisan. If it's regulatory issues that are the problem, we should fix the regulatory issues. If it's oversight, we should fix the, uh, we should have the oversight and, and use the power of the purse of Congress to make sure that these things aren't happening around the world, that we're creating good jobs in America and that we're growing our economy and we're pushing back against these supply chains that in this area of energy, it's coming from China. There's other countries as well, but the part that we should really be focusing on is doing away with China, so supplying these goods. So the question to the panel is where should our focus be? We brought you in as experts to coach the committee, and we're getting ready to develop legislation. What should we put in that legislation to, uh, to accomplish these goals? We'll start down on the... Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. I, I think you have to start by uh, agreeing to agree because bo both sides should agree on this. We can't export our pain while we buy an iPhone, but we are against a cobalt mine in America. Th that is just exporting the pain to Democratic Republic of Congo. We need to stop companies that do these practices from being able to sell their metals into America, and we need to streamline these laws, right? We need to streamline the laws that you're already looking at, NEPA and everything else, so that we can do it responsibly and well and and do it together and i have to say the the not only is that happening but think of carbon footprint i mean the right side is not really well represented but th this 
group is very worried about carbon footprint, that cobalt goes twice around the world to end up in your iPhone battery or your Tesla battery. Twice around the world, 50,000 miles. That is the average lithium ion battery metal travel. If we were doing it in America, you could have 2,000 miles as the carbon footprint. So there are great arguments on both sides of this. We need to do it together. I would start with streamlining technology, raising awareness, not accepting metal from, from these types of places. Mr. Franklin. Thank you for the opportunity to answer that question. Uh, just start with tribes, end with tribes. That's, that's kind of a way we, a way we like to, to reference when uh, there's regulatory actions that are taking place that impact us. So in other words, meaningful consultation upfront talking to tribes, avoiding these mistakes that are made, uh, the one that just happened with Reno Sparks Indian Colony at Thatcher Pass. You know, um, meaningful consultation that takes into account strategies that we can implement to avoid sacred sites, avoid cultural resource areas, avoid poisoning the waters that are going into tribal faucets. Um, I think that uh, if, we, if we can put that into legislation and strengthen the existing ones and find where's uh, places where it's not at that um, we can adequately mine um, and not on the backs of Indian tribes but like my brother here with Indian tribes um, and and that's that's what I would ask you to consider as you move forward Thank you. mr. Adams I agree with Chairman Franklin. Uh, we, we need to make sure that eco colonization isn't taking place on our tribes. Uh, where this year, where the Navajo with drilling at Chaco Canyon, the tribe represented and, and did the analysis and said, we need to be at five miles from Chaco Canyon. And the federal government came in and said, not nah, 10 works. That's the other side. I mean, e eco-colonization has to stop. To answer your question on the smelters and what we need to change, if we're going to go from two smelters to more, if, if we're going to continue to participate and keep up with world growth, we need energy. If we don't have enough electricity sitting on our grid, it doesn't matter how many smelters we have. We have an issue where we need to focus on baseload power. Coal is not the issue. Emissions are the issue. You know, President Biden said last night that we are a resilient country that has always moved forward. We're innovative. Then let's, let's find the answers. Let's, let's invest in the science, let's find the answers that's gonna drop the emissions to a level where we want them to be, but continue to use coal at a base level, our, our 20 to 25%. No one is arguing saying coal should be 80%. We're saying we need to stay at a baseload level to keep incubators running in hospitals and keeping people warm and cold when they need to be and to keep industry running. As we come into an EV economy where we need more power, this is the wrong time to be getting rid of coal. We need that base load. No coal company in the world is, is going to come and say, hey, there are these other great green solutions that solve the problem, and we're going to argue against that. But that's not our reality. We need, it. We need 50 years for the technology to be there, rely on cheap, reliable coal to get us there. And before we go to Mr. Summers, I want to address that for just a moment. I'm the, uh, the optimistic engineer. I've always said we shouldn't demonize the fuel source. We should work to uh, achieve the, jo the objectives we want to achieve with the fuel. Uh, I've had numerous groups come to me in the past few months telling me about new carbon sequestering technology where you strip the carbon off or somehow you take the carbon and you put it in a slurry, you inject the slurry into a deep well, and it turns back into rock. Um, you could uh, potentially have carbon-free energy from burning coal or burning natural gas if this technology is, is developed. So I think we have to continually push the envelope. That's what's going to change energy development around the world is when American ingenuity comes up with the most reliable, most affordable, and the cleanest, by whatever definition of clean you want to use, that other countries will adopt. I completely agree. And, and we believe in the innovation of the American people. We're not quitting on them. We're not going to say, no, we can't do it, and just get rid of whatever it may be. I, we don't understand why we're doing it with coal. Mr. Summers. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I want to uh, second what you said about, you know, American ingenuity and especially in investing in new, new technologies. And I think that the federal government has a very useful role to play because the federal government has the resources to take those R&D risks and the commercialization risks that are very difficult to be borne by private industry in many cases. And so I think that ensuring that our federal agencies and their federal programs that have adequate resources to invest in those kind of new technologies so that we can take advantage of American ingenuity and, and keep our, uh, our energy economy going the way that we need to. But also on the, the processing side, there are new processing technologies where you can go into waste streams, where you can go into tailings pond and pull out minerals that you know have, would be lost otherwise and would have to be developed elsewhere and, and inject those into the value stream as well. Just to give one example, our, our copper mine that I've, I've talked about, you know, just recently they opened up a tellurium circuit. So tellurium is a, a mineral that's used specifically in, in PV cells and solar panels. And you know, most of that was coming from China again, but there was a US company that decided that they wanted to source this mineral from the US. They went to Rio Tinto Kennecott and said, you know, can you pull this out of your waste stream? We'll pay for it. We'll pay the extra money that it's gonna cost. We don't have to buy it from China. It's pulled out of that waste stream. It's sent to Canada to be processed. And then it comes back here and it's put into to solar cells. And frankly, those cells are more expensive than what you get from China. And so if there's going to be incentives for for solar production, then make sure that those incentives are directed at, at North American or US product streams as opposed to, again, uh, being able to be pulled out of other countries. And I think too, just in, in, in general, especially for these minerals that we need, the critical minerals, the minerals that we need for national defense systems, the federal government has to insist on domestic sourcing for those. Again, I mentioned you, you can't have a, an F-35 without beryllium. Part of the reason that we have beryllium is because the federal government decades ago decided that they wanted to invest in developing our beryllium resources here in the U.S. and now we're the major producer of beryllium. Eighty percent of the market is controlled by the U.S. and that's because the federal government decided that they needed to make sure that beryllium that was needed especially for airframes in this country was coming from the U.S. that we controlled that supply and we need to do that for all kinds of different minerals so that again we don't have a critical minerals you know, we don't have a, a national defense system that relies upon one of our adversaries to give us that, that mineral in some cases that you've never heard of, but that you have to have for an alloying process, that you have to have for, you know, for, for magnesium that you need for, you know, defending against an airframe against missile attacks. I mean, those are all things that, again, most people don't think about, but our, our folks at DOD and other places within the federal government think about that. But in many cases, they can't go outside of the country to acquire those minerals, and that's just incredibly counterproductive. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Summers. Thank you again to all the witnesses. Um, I could stay here probably all afternoon, but uh, okay. uh, Mr. Grijalva <laughs> is uh, growing impatient with me over here. We want to keep as much uh, collegiality as we can on the committee. So. Uh, Again, thank you to the witnesses, thank you to the members, uh, and the members of the committee uh, may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we'll ask you to respond to those in writing. Also got a few things to submit to the record, a letter from the National Mining Association, without objection, so ordered, um, a letter from Rec Representative Amade, um, without objection, so ordered. And under committee rule three, members of the committee must submit questions to the committee clerk by 5 p.m. on Monday, February 13th. The hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for those responses. If there is no further business, without objection, the committee stands adjourned.